the immunocompromised host, but also in the community and in the environment. And there is a very nice study trying to assess what are currently the drivers. There are actually many. But of course, we have to focus also on external in environmental factors that might influence AMR globally. And you can see here some of the major extrinsic factors, like the changing patterns of use of fungicides and bactericides in the environment and waste management. The changing at risk human host groups, we all know that there were a vast majority of COVID-19 <coughs> patients who had co-infections or secondary infections. Um, Changing climates might alter the geographical range and niche and landscape <coughs> of AMR. Novel routes of infections, like for example natural disasters, changing biotic interactions, and of course, as we said, the changing virulence of the microorganisms as dynamic uh, uh, environments change over time. And if we would like to assess the level of ep epidemic preparedness, this is uh, actually uh, published a few days ago. This is the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board Committee. And what are the results, as you can see here? Not very optimistic. So the framework has revealed significant weakness or declining capacities in several critical areas of preparedness, including global uh, coordination in research and development, efforts to address, to address misinformation, community engagement, participation of low and middle income countries in decision making, domestic and international financing of preparedness, independent monitoring, and meaningful involvement of relevant actors. Okay. Now we are wiser and a bit concerned. What are the steps to apply the One Health approach in the epidemic and pandemic preparedness? And the answer, of course, is here. You can see, first of all, the One Health Joint Plan Action for 2022-2026 with six action track priorities. Action track number one, enhancing One Health capacities to strengthen health systems. Two, reducing the risks from emerging and re-emerging zoonotic epidemics and pandemics. Three, controlling and eliminating zoonotic neglected tropical and vector-borne disease. Four, strengthening the assessment, management, and communication of food safety risks. Five, curbing the silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance. And finally, six, integrating the environment into One Health. And I would like to close with some examples that we do have as solutions for AMR. This is also published recently from WHO, and it focuses on two multimodal strategies on two main pillars, applying national and international infection control and prevention measures together with antimicrobial stewardship uh, uh, initiatives. And specifically for those programs, you see the subsectors that are very, very important, guidelines, education and training, surveillance, monitoring, auditing, and feedback. And as faculty members, at least for us, for our community, we need to focus on awareness, training, and continuous education, both of the public, but also of the healthcare workers. Finishing, of course, we need the establishment of central uh, EU bodies if we are discussing about Europe in order to coordinate such an endeavor for the epidemic and pandemic preparedness. And we do have recently one in the EU, which is called HERA, the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Framework. And as you can see, they started being very, very active in order to promote all the steps that needs to be done in order to improve our preparedness framework. And Last but not least, I would like to focus on partnership, scientific partnership, building cross-sectional, interdisciplinary scientific networks and partnerships on epidemic and pandemic preparedness. And this is one of that, the Be Ready project. And actually with that, I would like to finish uh, and thank you because actually in Next week, we will have the pleasure as Medical School of EUC to co-coordinate uh, the European, um, the European um, let's say, advanced education courses for antimicrobial stewardship and infection control, and hopefully we will bring this course also in Cyprus in the following years. And closing, don't depend on the enemy not coming. 
depend rather on being ready for him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pana, for presenting uh, uh, during our first post-COVID-19 epoch uh, uh, the epidemiological news and what's coming up regarding the One Health, the role of One Health. And uh, before questions, I would like just to say a few words about our assistant professor, uh, Dr. Zoe Pana, who is a specialist in pediatrics, a faculty member at the European University. Uh, at the medical school, uh, specialized in epidemiology, infection control, and antimicrobial stewardship at the Johns Hopkins Hospital USA. She's a reviewer in several peer review international journals, and she has a considerably high number of publications in international journals. Zoe is a scientific member of the COVID-19 National Committee at the Ministry of Health in Cyprus, and scientific consultant of the Minister of Health. She is representing Cyprus at the EU Scientific Advice Platform on COVID-19 under the auspices of the European Commission. And she is the national coordinator for the COVID-19 EU Horizon Program Vaccelerate, the pan-European vaccine trial network. So thank you once again, and we are open for questions. Uh, if we don't have any question, now we'll ask uh, Zoe a question. So uh, this is all uh, nice uh, about One Health, but where do the humanities fit in all of this? Like the psychologists, sociologists, etc. And we saw this to be a quite an important problem during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much, Professor Litras, for your question. Actual, actually, social sciences and behavioral change, in a way, are a key point for all, uh, for One Health, but generally speaking for epidemics and infectious diseases, because uh, actually we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic that it's very, very important to proceed with behavioral change, which is actually not very easy. So we need this kind of expertise uh, in order to, in a way, communicate correctly, show to the public the meaning and the impact of uh, uh, adapting, in a way, One Health uh, approach in their everyday lives. So I think that the beauty, let's say, of One Health is that it truly interconnects multiple disciplines with uh, a common vision. So bearing in mind what we have witnessed also during the COVID-19 pandemic, I truly believe that social sciences are an important key point for, let's say, all these initiatives and endeavors. So thank you very much. So if there are any behavioral scientists in the audience, don't go away. We need you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So now we move to uh, the next uh, lecture by Professor John Ioannidis, uh, who is a professor of medicine, epidemiology, and population health, and professor of biomedical data science at uh, the School of Medicine and Professor of Statistics at the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford, as well as co-director of METRICS, the Meta Research Innovation Center at uh, Stanford. Professor Ioannidis' work aims to improve research methods and uh, to enhance approaches to integrating uh, information and generalize, uh, generating reliable evidence. So uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Ioannidis, thank you. Thank you very much, Theodore. Thank you for the, the very kind invitation. Um, I hope you can hear me, and let's see if I can share my slides. Can you see them now? Yes? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So uh, I, I will share some thoughts revisiting the COVID-19 epidemiology after the pandemic. Uh, we have been four years uh, since uh, COVID-19 uh, visited us, and I think that we have suffered, but hopefully also learned a lot from that suffering. Uh, this has been a major uh, scientific response to a major crisis, 
We've had about 2 million scientists publishing, about 1 million scientific papers on COVID-19. Uh, these scientists came from all walks of life, from all scientific fields. And actually, during the two first pandemic years, 2020-2021, 98 of the 100 most cited papers across all science were on COVID-19. Uh, so, so clearly, that was a topic that attracted tremendous attention. And hopefully, we should have accumulated by now a lot of evidence about what happened and what might happen also in the future in similar situations. Unfortunately, the quality of the science suffered mostly. Most of that work uh, was not of uh, sufficient quality. Most of that was done in a state of crisis and panic and, and haste. Uh, we, you know, we had to act very fast and, you know, probably not much of what we published was very, very sound. A lot of the early thinking about the pandemic depended on models. We had no data, so we had to depend on, on mathematical modeling and specul speculation. But models are known to be very easy to fail. They're useful. They, they have a role in, in trying to think about a problem and how to uh, make expectations and projections and perhaps what we could do about it. But we saw very quickly that models were very easy to fail. Um, the problem was, to a large extent, that even our very rough data that we had, even on very basic constructs, like how many people are dying from COVID-19, had a lot of uncertainty, even in high-income countries. There are broader considerations for the failed forecasting from a modeling. We had not only poor data input on key features of the pandemic that went into theory-based forecasting, but also poor data input for database forecasting, wrong assumptions in the modeling, high sensitivity of the estimates that very little changes would result to very different projections, lack of incorporation of epidemiological features, poor past evidence on effects of available interventions, lack of transparency, uh, errors, unavoidably so, many times, lack of determinacy, looking at only one or a few dimensions of a very complex problem that included multiple health and social and behavioral and economic and societal dimensions, lack of expertise in crucial disciplines and people who were performing that modeling, groupthink, bandwagon effects, and selective reporting. Transparency, I think, is, is something that we can gain as a lesson for the future. Uh, when we looked at models uh, published before the pandemic and after the pandemic, we saw pretty much no big difference other than the fact that we were publishing far more models now. But when you look at code sharing and data sharing, only about 20% of the models did at least one of the two, and only about 6% of the models both shared the code and the data so that one could really see how they work and try to replicate them, validate them, reuse them, fine tune them and improve them. I would argue that for predictive purposes, we need to start pre-registering models. And this is happening now in a number of teams. I think that it has to become far more widespread so that we can compare in a timestamp manner what we were predicting versus what was happening and then try to select the best models moving forward. Of course, there's advantages and disadvantages and there's ways that this can be done more easily or more in, in a more difficult way. If we don't do that, then I think we're open to a lot of selective reporting. I think the most classic example of selective reporting was the, the two Imperial College models, uh, one of them finding that lockdown uh, uh, could save 3.1 million lives just in the first wave, uh, but also Imperial College had a second model that they had produced at the same time, which they didn't publish uh, in Nature. But actually, when we looked at that second model, it had much better fit to the data and suggested that lockdown would not really save any lives compared to the less disruptive measures that uh, could have been taken. Um, now, what was the end product of all these major crises? We had excess deaths. So excess deaths are a composite hard outcome that probably can tell us uh, what happened if you take into account all the dimensions of the crisis. Uh, so both uh, what the virus did and both what the virus did to our health systems and also what we did to our health systems and to our society and all the measures that, that we took. It would sound pretty straightforward that, well, we should be able to calculate how many excess tests we have compared to the pre-pandemic years. But even these calculations are not easy and they depend of uh, excess death calculations for the first two years, 2020 and 2021 in Germany. Uh, work uh, when we adjusted for the change in the age structure of the population, which is indispensable unless you do that. I mean, you, you're failing epidemiology 101. We got 55,000 excess deaths. Without age adjustment, we got 125,000 excess deaths. Most of the of the widely publicized uh, 
and, and circulated estimates of excess deaths had not age adjusted, and they came up with 203, 88,000, 113,000. Some other colleagues who did adjust for age got only 22,000. Another team that did not adjust got 130,000. In Germany, this is a classic example that I put here because the number of people aged more than 80 years increased from 4.8 million in 2016 to 5.8 million in 2020. So consideration of age is crucial if we're to make any estimates, but you see how wide uh, and how disparate these calculations can be. So one approach is to make very different assumptions and to try all possible assumptions, for example, all possible assumptions on what would be the comparator years and uh, get what I call a multiverse analysis. We, we have experience from multiverse analysis in other fields in epidemiology and other sciences, and we applied that in the case of COVID-19. What you see is that some countries did very well regardless of what assumptions you make uh, compared to other countries. And some countries did horribly, again, regardless of what assumptions you make. For example, within Europe, Sweden did the best, no matter what assumptions you make, more or less, and if you take all these high income countries, the United States did horribly. And actually, it was doing horribly even before the pandemic. All the other countries were improving their life expectancy, while US was pretty stationary or getting even worse. And, and I can go through uh, a lot of reasons why, unfortunately, in public health, we have had a serious problem and we have not been able to protect our population, not just during the pandemic but also before the pandemic with lots of vulnerabilities and lots of inequalities and lots of marginalized people and lots of concurrent pandemics like uh, overdose and alcohol and obesity. This is uh, showing the same data. Uh, you see that some countries always rank among the best and some countries always rank among the worst. This is a paper that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks uh, in PNAS where we, we grouped high income countries and those that had uh, pretty reliable data in the human mortality database uh, into two groups, uh, th those that were vulnerable uh, and uh, we use very simple vulnerability indicators, GDP per capita, proportion living in poverty and in inequality, uh, Gini index, uh, uh, and those who were not vulnerable. So you have 17 countries in each group and you see that uh, uh, Bulgaria and the United States are doing the worst uh, and uh, pretty much all the vulnerable countries are doing very poor. Uh, all the non-vulnerable countries are doing very well. Interestingly, some of the non-vulnerable countries started with substantial excess death estimates uh, in the first year. For example, you see Belgium and you see Sweden there that start with, uh, with red color when uh, it's mid-2020. But by mid-2023, uh, Sweden has 3.5% fewer deaths during the pandemic years compared to the three pre-pandemic years. So, Sweden has a, a death deficit. It has the best performance across Europe. New Zealand has the same performance, minus 3.6% compared to 2017, 2019. As compared to other countries that were vulnerable, uh, and that includes uh, Greece, unfortunately, that had very substantial excess uh, deaths uh, during that period. This is looking at the same data as a function of uh, nominal per capita GDP and also taking the other vulnerability uh, factors into consideration, you see that the two groups of countries are pretty well separated. And you have some countries that, that really survive that crisis uh, with no losses or very little losses, in some cases doing even better than the pre-pandemic years, and other countries that uh, had really horrible outcomes. Personalized risk was a, a major debate during the pandemic, and also the question of whether we can really protect some people more than others. We, we knew that personalized risk was very different uh, across the board, across age groups and across other vulnerability indicators. But the question was, can we really protect people uh, by doing something special for them? And, and unfortunately, I think in most countries, we, we didn't manage to protect those who required to be protected, those who needed to be shielded. Uh, some countries did achieve precision shielding, and we have this type of data indirectly from seroprevalence studies that we can look at seroprevalence in different age groups, for example, or in different circumstances. But others had inverse protection, which means that the people who are more vulnerable were more frequently infected. It's vulnerable. And uh, I, I think that moving forward, we need to think of, of how we could inverse that and learn from the success stories rather than, than from the failures. The estimates that went into our calculations were probably exaggerated and having more mature data, we can see now uh, what the personalized risk uh, looked like during different phases of the pandemic. We could also see what kind of loss of uh, life uh, 
uh, years uh, one might anticipate. For example, uh, in countries that have na national uh, databases uh, like Sweden, we could look at the nursing health population and we can see uh, what is the trajectory of people who were infected uh, by SARS-CoV-2 within nursing homes. We see a very steep increase in the risk of death uh, after infection. But for people who survived after the first month uh, or two months, the risk goes below baseline. And, and that means that these people practically as a population lost on average a number of months, you know, probably less than a year of, uh, of life uh, uh, anticipation. But in the long term, when you look at a, a window of three or four years, uh, these deaths would not be counted in your excess death calculations because these people would have died even without the SARS-CoV-2 infection within a few months. Uh, these are data from um, uh, the most recent evaluation that we did on age stratified infection fatality rate in the non-elderly population. Again, much lower estimates from the, the most unbiased national seroprevalence studies uh, looking before vaccination. And, and then you can look at what's happening after the advent of vaccination and after the advent of, of reinfections, where reinfections were also very common and currently probably uh, they're just the rule. It's, it's extremely common that you would see a primary infection at this point that we have reached endemicity. Uh, we have many studies, including several from my team, that have studied the risk of reinfection and also what the kind of uh, outcomes it may portend in terms of hospitalization risk and death risk. Uh, in, in our data, uh, hospitalization risk has tremendously decreased. Death risk has decreased even more so. And I think with further reinfections, it's likely to be even less and, and less. Uh, uh, we have data on different segments of the population. For example, uh, these are data on children where reinfections are less frequently documented, but I'm not sure whether this is really, really true that they're less infected or just simply uh, they're less likely to be detected because almost all of them are entirely asymptomatic. So e even in the times that we were doing a lot of testing, uh, probably the vast majority of, of them were still being missed. Um, data from uh, Denmark in the general population uh, during the Omicron wave shows that that tremendous uh, decrease in the infection fatality that uh, uh, even in the elderly groups uh, tends to be extremely high. Here we're talking about 30-day infection fatality rates per 100,000 infections, and you see that they range from 1.6 to 15.1 per 100,000 infections uh, in early 2022. Vaccines were a major success uh, in the fact that they were developed so quickly and we could uh, use them um, with uh, with pretty good effectiveness, I believe, in the beginning um, for those who could get vaccinated, uh, especially before they were being infected. And unfortunately, there's lots of uh, people around the world who didn't benefit in that regard. The question is, what do we do moving forward? Uh, these are some data that we looked at the entire data from Austria all the population of Austria had, that had been previously infected or had documented previous infection. We tried to see what happened last year from November 2022 until this year, end of uh, summer, uh, based on the fourth dose that they would get as a booster versus just uh, not getting that and sticking to just three doses. We, we see that there's a benefit early on, and this has been seen in other studies in terms of the infection risk. But actually, after three months, we see a reversal, and by June, we see a 43% increase in the risk of infection on those people who had the fourth dose versus those who had the three doses. When we also looked at COVID-19 deaths, we saw no benefit. Actually, we saw a trend for increased mortality in those who got the booster versus those who did not get the booster. What we have learned from the pandemic, from my perspective, is that decision-making, both personal and public, must be multidimensional. This is something that many people alluded to and thought that, uh, goodness, we have a major crisis. We need to think about everything that could go wrong because lots of things were going wrong and a lot of things are going wrong. And maybe some of the repercussions are still early to say. For example, disruption in cancer prevention may be something that will show up as uh, excess mortality downstream, not even now, but maybe after five or 10 years. Or disruption in preventive efforts for some childhood diseases may also manifest itself in the future. Or in or 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 uh, marginalized or, or or losing their education these are repercussions that unfortunately we will count our law decades to come i would argue that another lesson that we learned was that we need randomized trials a pandemic is not going to go away in a day we have time to run randomized trials we did run 
a number of excellent randomized trials like recovery and solidarity, the adaptive platforms that taught us a lot about the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of some interventions, but I think that we need more and we need more also for non-pharmaceutical interventions, not just for, for drugs and, and biologics. We need to, to have a holistic approach and that uh, includes considering all the moderators of the crisis, which is uh, in many cases, social order and stability, healthcare and welfare support that is lacking or is uh, diseased in, in many cases, in many countries, other crises <coughs> like war that we see now, uh, unfortunately erupting in different places around the world, pre-existing poverty and hardship and pre-existing mental health problems that, that get accentuated by uh, everything that happens during the pandemic and by everything also that we do. We need to think about side effects like financial insecurity, hardship, learning losses, mental and physical health deterioration and the collective trauma. All of these giving rise to rising inequalities, making worse for everyone around the world. We also know that some of our early dreams like zero COVID were just blatant failures. And, and we saw that uh, re again and again in different countries, uh, the final uh, victim of that was China where we don't even really know exactly what happened, but probably it was a disaster, not just because of the many people who died uh, when the measures were uh, relieved and uh, people were still not prepared, but even more so perhaps uh, because of the consequences of the very long-term lockdown and restrictions that led to many disruptions in other aspects of healthcare. For example, just the losses because of extra deaths from cardiovascular disease in Hong Kong, uh, if you extrapolate them to China, would probably be far more than the deaths that uh, COVID-19 uh, could have caused on its own. Uh, these are just some efforts to try to calculate how many people died from SARS-CoV-2 in China, but uh, you have to speculate if these were similar to, for example, South Korea uh, or, or Hong Kong, uh, again, places that had some sudden uh, or, or late uh, removal of measures, but not as late as uh, in the case of China. We also need to, to be very careful about uh, all, everything that we want to infer based on the epidemiology lessons, because uh, I mentioned one example where calculations can be completely wrong if you don't adjust for changing population structure, but we also need to learn and adjust for other high risk indicators. We need to think about how our data uh, are performing long-term. For example, death registration in many countries is still very suboptimal. We try to make completeness corrections, but these are very speculative and arbitrary. Uh, there's high sensitivity to our modeling choices. Uh, many people perform post hoc corrections to try to fit data to some narrative or other, but obviously these are probably even worse. Um, we need to try to model very different causes of mortality that have very different footprints on the population. Very often we underestimate uncertainty and uh, very often we causally misinterpret what exactly went on and what were really the factors that led to the excess problems. So where do we go uh, moving forward? We need to deal with a lot of problems that uh, are with us and have been with us and were actually accentuated during the pandemic. We need to deal with uh, factors that underlie many, most, the majority of COVID-19 deaths. This include social injustice, inequalities, racism, poverty, smoking, obesity, other modifiable risk factors and lifestyle our poor protection of nursing homes that uh, even before the pandemic, they had mostly be surrendered in many countries to for-profit structures and they had been abandoned to their fate. Poor adoption of effective public health measures that are easy, they're not disruptive, they're cheap and, and plain to do, but actually they're not adopted. Or adoption of harmful public health measures like the draconian lockdowns and the, the zero COVID uh, approaches. Suboptimal and harmful treatments uh, and medical interventions. So we, we had uh, a lot of interventions like hydroxychloroquine that were thought to be effective, but actually were not. In a meta-analysis, we even see that there's an increased mortality by their use. And finally, lack of effective vaccination and ineffective or inefficient vaccination strategies. We should not panic in the future again. Um, uh, this is a paper that I published recently with Arnaud Choliero and Stefano Tancredi in the European Journal of Epidemiology, where we argue for slow data public health. Uh, there's three major problems that we need to recognize. There's confusion. There's too much trust in big data that just collect themselves on their own, but they do not speak by themselves. And there's also a mounting infodemic with high volumes of information producers 
spreading misinformation and doubts on the reliability of information and of experts, as well as on the independence of institutions producing information. We can deal with all of that, but we need to be very, very careful. We need to think very carefully. We need to think about what type of data do we need? How do we collect those? How do we revisit our decisions in real time in ways that are not disruptive? Pandemic preparedness, uh, as uh, Dr. Panas showed, is very important. But the fact that we need to be well prepared does not mean that pandemic preparedness should disrupt life. Pandemic preparedness requires evidence. It requires reproducible evidence. Conversely, I think we should improve living conditions and opportunities, especially for those who are in need and for those who are disadvantaged. We need to build and maintain trust in public health, and we need to see the big picture and not lose track of the big picture. With many thanks to a number of my colleagues who participated and joined uh, forces with me in about 90 peer-reviewed papers that I published during the pandemic, probably most of them are wrong, but maybe some of them might survive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ioannidis, uh, for a great uh, speech and uh, especially for highlighting the importance of uh, uh, the social determinants of health and uh, in particular uh, um, uh, about the association between the excess uh, mortality estimates and the uh, vulnerability uh, indices. Uh, uh, social determinant of, of health is something that our students here are very familiar with. Uh, they realize that its importance. It is uh, nice that you gave us uh, many such examples of how uh, they play a role uh, during the pandemic. So, uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, if there are uh, no questions for the audience, I would uh, love to ask you uh, a question. Uh, I've been dying to ask this one to you for a long time. So you uh, speak a lot about the COVID COVIDization of science, uh, both today and uh, in general. And uh, I wish to ask you uh, whether you think that is really bad. I mean, it's understandable that a uh, uh, once-in-a-lifetime pandemic would uh, attract all this interest. And you mentioned, of course, the um, uh, poor quality of many of these researchers. But I wanted to ask you in particular, do you think uh, that this COVIDization resulted in worse science? Is, or is it just a reflection of the standard suboptimal scientific practices that we have? So did the COVID pandemic and this COVIDization made things Worse, or is it just a reflection? I think that uh, the brief answer is that uh, things got worse. Uh, and uh, there's a number of comparative assessments comparing COVID research to non COVID research. COVID research uh, for different types of designs, you know, prognostic models, uh, clinical trials, uh, uh, prevalence studies, uh, systematic reviews, and meta analysis tends to be worse and sometimes uh, substantially worse compared to non-COVID research. Now, this is understandable to some extent because uh, uh, things were done in haste, in state of panic. Uh, there was a sense of uh, we need all hands on board. Uh, uh, people who were not experts in, in a given field thought, you know, very well intentioned. Uh, I want to help. Uh, so I know about how to work with data and there's data here. Let me work with, with, uh, with this and see what I can do. But, but obviously this is a recipe for disaster. So uh, uh, all the malfunctions that we had identified in the past, uh, the pandemic gave an impetus to them. <laughs> and, and I don't want to, to paint a, a completely pessimistic picture because obviously among 1 million papers, there's lots of wonderful work and there's lots of great successes. And, and we have some, I mentioned, you know, some very nice trials. I mentioned vaccines as mostly a success story, even though they were oversold. And there's also some aspects that unfortunately were not presented the way that they should. Um, so should we see things as half empty or half full or 90% or empty and 10% full? Um, I, I think we can keep the, the positive lessons, but uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, we need some, what I mentioned as a slow data <laughs> uh, and, and slow does not mean inefficient. Slow means, uh, okay, what do we need to know and what is the best way to go about it? of speculation and, and uh, very poor modeling and very poor uh, collections of, of pieces of, of evidence that just were very 
So thank you very much and thank you for all of your work trying to make our science better. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Have a wonderful In honor of an outstanding physician and a blessed human being, Professor Dr. Loisos Loizu, one of the top 100 hematology influencing physicians in the field of pediatric oncology. The second session will be about childhood cancer. We would like now to call upon the chairs, Professors Costas Lampropoulos and Professors Anastasi Stefano. Once again, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Loisa Loizu. <laughs> professor uh, Dr. Loisa Loizu is a clinical professor of pediatrics, pediatric oncology, hematology, medical school, University of Nicosia. Former Director of Pediatric Oncology Hematology Clinic Archibiscop Macarius III Hospital, Nicosia. President of the Elpida Foundation for Children and Adolescents Affected by Cancer or Leukemia. Loisus Loisu, after his studies in medicine in Brussels, Belgium, and his specialization in pediatrics and pediatric oncology hematology in Strasbourg and Nancy in France, was invited by the Minister of Health of Cyprus in 1989 to return to Cyprus and undertake the establishment and operation of the Pediatric Oncology Hematology Department of the, at the Archbishop Macarius III Hospital, which he has run till today. He is a uh, founder of Pediatric Oncology Hematology in Cyprus. He, he undertook the training of the medical nursing in order to create the entire necessary infrastructure to provide the best possible care for the cancerous and leukemic children. In November 1996, he was in charge of the team of doctors who carried out the first bone uh, marrow transplantation in Cyprus, writing a new charter of historical importance for medicine in Cyprus. Additionally, this uh, team created the first modern leukemia diagnostic laboratory and the first cryopreservation facility in the country for storing reportant umbilical cord and bone marrow stem cells at the Archbishop Macarius III Hospital in Nicosia. Since 1990, he's established the first even cancer registry in Cyprus, the Pediatric Oncology Registry of Cyprus, which was initially until 1998 uh, a hospital-based registry. After the creation of the Cyprus National Cancer Reg Registry in 1998, the Pediatric Oncology Registry of Cyprus was further developed and became a population-based childhood and adolescent cancer registry. In 1990, he created and is the president of the Elpida Foundation for Children with Cancer and Leukemia. Professor Loizu, uh, with his unique experience of uh, 37 years of exclusive clinical occupation with childhood cancer and leukemia, continues his clinical and research work uh, in uh, epidemiology issues, cancers, syndromes, and trials, including new adicarsen agents. His lecture today is the title for the search of causes and prevention of childhood cancer and the Cyprus enigma. Professor Loizu, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Good morning. Childhood cancer was already described in ancient Egypt and also in ancient Greece. 
always a very sad event, and we had to wait till 1960s to see the first progress in the therapies. Nowadays, more than 80% of the children are cured, but the question is, is this is a solution? No, the solution is to prevent them. And in order to prevent them, we have to know the causes, and I thank very much Professor Patrigios and his team for inviting me to talk about this issue today and also talk about the Cyprus enigma. My purpose is to give you an idea of the childhood cancer spectrum, talk about the differences between cancer in adults and children, the causes, the prevention, and the Cyprus situation. Childhood cancer is not one disease, it's a spectrum of different malignancies, 12 major categories, more than 100 subtypes, and the most frequent forms are acute leukemia, CNS tumors, lymphomas, and other more rare types, which are constituted by embryonal tumors and others. Just keep in mind that more than 60% are represented by leukemias, brain tumors, and lymphomas. Children are not small adults, and there is a difference uh, between the adult cancers and the childhood cancers. The type of, child, of adult cancers, as you know, the most common are lung, uh, prostate, colon, uh, breast, uh, uterus, and others. Or in childhood, as I mentioned before, they are different. The causes are different. We know much more about the causes about uh, uh, adulthood cancer, but very little about in children. Therapies are different. Uh, we always take into consideration the developing uh, uh, age, uh, the developing organism of the children. Therefore, uh, our primary concern is to devise therapies and give therapies that provoke the less possible long-term sequela because we want to cure our children, but cure them well and not to have uh, serious problems when they will be adults. It's, a specialization is necessary and it's different than what we have in the adult setting because the persons, the doctors who take care of children with cancer must be, first of all, pediatricians. That's self-evident. And then specialize in pediatric oncology. Prevention, uh, primary prevention, and also screening and detection are very limited in childhood, and prognosis is better. What, would, what do we know about the causes? There are genetic and environmental causes. Concerning the genetics, we know that up to 10% of cousin children are due to inherited germline pathogenic mutations in, in cancer predisposition genes. And there is an important group of um, diseases, the cancer predisposition syndromes. This is a non-exhaustive list uh, that uh, as clinicians, we have to be able to detect them so much as pediatricians, as, adult, as adults, because if we recognize them, we can establish uh, preventive uh, active surveillance programs that can be significant in preventing deaths. There are also de novo genetic causes. Genetic alterations may happen during embryonal life, into one of the germ cells, uh, during the development of the child, uh, with structural or numeric chromosomal alterations. And a typical example that you know is trisomy 21, and these patients, these persons have a higher risk to develop leukemia. I want to stay a little bit on cancer predisposition syndromes because it's very important for the clinicians, and also it's important because their uh, percentage of the population has been increasing in recent years. I give you the example of the Lifromeni syndrome. The Lifromeni syndrome, as you know, is involved with mutations in the TP53 gene, and these persons uh, are prone to develop uh, certain kinds of tumors like brain tumors, leukemias, bone tumors, sarcomas, and others. And if we have the example of the families with Lifromeni that they have been put under surveillance, it's the red line that you see here, the top line, the survival is almost 100%, but you see the big percentage of deaths in the families, who, in the persons who are not put under surveillance. Therefore, it's important to be able as clinicians to do a good, uh, take a good history, good examination, uh, and find cancer predisposition syndromes. In this case, for example, uh, in a patient with Lifraomeni, a whole body MRI in the frame of active surveillance showed a, a very early stage of a lung adenocarcinoma, which of course is much more easier to treat and cure. More examples of CPS uh, cancer predisposition syndromes, re retinoblastoma, a typical uh, pathognomonic, I would say, uh, sign is Lefkogoria, this white reflex. Uh, this, in this case, is bilateral and more frequently is uh, related to germ, uh, germline mutation. 
This is a unilater unilateral Lefkogoria. Uh, this in unilateral is uh, more frequently sporadic cases. Another case important uh, 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 that I would like to show to you also as an example is the fa familial adenomatous polyposis. For example, in this girl, it's a, a patient of our department. It was a girl uh, with desmoid tumor, uh, aggressive fibromatosis. And knowing that this uh, disease, among others, can be associated with gene involvement, or uh, the gene involved is APC of the, of the disease I mentioned before, we asked for a genetic uh, control of the family. The father was a carrier, and he uh, underwent colonoscopy. Um, polyps were found, and then from there, a systematic screening started for the family, and such cases can be life-saving. Similar scenarios for the NF1 uh, cases, you know, most probably as clinicians, the cafe or less spots in NF1, a rare genetic disorder, but it's the most frequent cancer predisposition syndrome. These patients are prone to develop various kinds of benign and malignant tumors. Uh, usually, diagnosis is not very difficult to make uh, because of the multiple cafe or less spots. Of course, there are criteria for this. Uh, typical axillary and inguinal freckling, multiple cutaneous neurofibroma, and the typical, uh, as you see on the iris, uh, the little white uh, uh, spots who are called uh, leash nodules. Uh, also, I would like to mention an, a couple of more such um, cancer predisposition syndromes who are important uh, for prevention also, because uh, every time we have children or even adults who have as congenital anomalies, we should always think about cancer predisposition syndromes. In this case, in the uh, loss of WT1 gene with aniridia, you see that this child has not uh, iris. Uh, you can have, uh, because of the loss of this tumor suppressor gene, you can have various tumors. I show to you here a typical Wacker syndrome combining Williams tumor, aniridia, and other anomalies. Another example, beckwith wittmann syndrome, BWS, loss of uh, another tumor suppression gene, WT2. And this is uh, typical with signs of overgrowth, uh, glossomegaly, you see the tongue of these children, visceromegaly, hemipertrophy, and these uh, persons are prone to have more frequently uh, cancers. Environmental factors. In adults, we know a lot of them. I'm not going to delve into them. You know them already. But in children, we know two little things. Let's see what we know. We know the, the ionizing radiation. The typical example of the atomic bomb explosions in Japan with uh, increased leukemias to expose children, Chernobyl and thyroid cancer, exposition to X-rays in utero and CT scan, increased risk, and other environmental factors, benzene, pr uh, prior chemotherapy or radiotherapy, persons who have been treated are more prone to develop uh, secondary cancers, hormonal factors, infections, such as Epstein-Barr, HPV, hepatitis B, and others, and antenatal exposures, such as dietary factors, uh, obesity, and increased birth weight. Now, there are certain associations uh, that uh, increase the risk. Uh, father's tobacco smoking is associated with increased acute lymphoblastic leukemia in childhood, exposure of parents to ionizing radiation with leukemia and brain tumors, exposure to pesticides, outdoor air pollution, traffic pollution, maternal consumption of QR associated to less risk for leukemia. Prevention. As I said before, most children are cured, but we don't want that, we want to prevent. However, since we don't have uh, uh, knowledge of causes, uh, prevention, pre preventive measures are limited. Uh, what do we have to do to understand this more? Uh, there are many measures we can do, data analysis, epidemiological studies, but uh, the most important thing is to establish good data. We did this in Cyprus with the Pediatric Oncology Registry of Cyprus, a population-based uh, uh, registry, and this is very important to conduct studies, and this can help us to make uh, um, um, descriptive and analytic studies in order to better understand and exercise better cancer control activities. Since we don't know what we can do uh, at present, okay, well, we can do apply and educate people, parents, uh, on what we know already about the good effects of breastfeeding, prevention effect, uh, avoidance of maternal obesity, maternal diet, preconception, postconception, and educate the people who want to procreate for healthy lifestyle, healthy nutrition, and avoid smoking. 
avoid any kind of ionizing radiation, eliminate useless uh, ionizing uh, diagnostic examinations, avoid uh, pesticides, cure meets obesity, control infectious agents, uh, and educate early in life our children, because if we educate them very early, uh, they will de develop uh, behaviors that will prevent uh, cancer in adulthood. The Cyprus enigma, I would like to stay a little bit on this, on this. Uh, during the last two years, our uh, group published two studies about pattern and temporal trends, and also about uh, uh, thyroid cancer in Cyprus. I will show you the main findings. The ASRW, the standardized incidence rate show, showed that we had 203, one of the highest in the world concerning the childhood cancer incidence in Cyprus. Uh, concerning the major groups, so you see the first three groups who constitute 70% is the group of leukemias, the, the first one, then lymphomas, then specified epithelial, uh, which are mostly thyroid cancer, and then uh, uh, brain tumors. I show you this because it's different. These patterns of distribution of uh, kinds of tumors is different than uh, in other countries. Also, interestingly, the trends for the 20 years period of our study did not show any significant trend in spite of uh, the overall increased ASRW, but there was one exception, significant exception, for thyroid cancer with an annual percentage change of 7.6%, especially in the 15, 19 years old, and metastatic cases. And that was very alarming. So overall, we found that Cyprus had among world's highest. Only Italy and Belgium have higher ASRW incidence rates, standardized rates than Cyprus. Uh, the pattern of distribution of the, of the major groups is different than in other countries. And although leukemias were the most frequent, like in other countries, lymphomas and thyroid cancer were more frequent than brain tumors. And of course, uh, the thyroid cancer, very alarming because we have most probably the highest in the world in our adolescents, and significantly increasing temporal trends affecting the 15, 19 years old, mostly girls and boys. Therefore, these uh, uh, special characteristics in Cyprus uh, made it mandatory for us to find answers to these questions. It's not easy as elsewhere in the world. So we formulated four hypotheses. Uh, let's see them, ionizing radiation, uh, we know that in Cyprus, unfortunately, since decades, there is a lot of useless abuse, I would say, of uh, ionizing radiation and uh, CT scans or radiations for uh, the teeth dentistry. So uh, we do efforts to limit exposure, exposure. However, to study is difficult for us at present for many methodolo methodological reasons. Radon is low in Cyprus. Arsenic draw our uh, attention because um, it can be carcinogenic, and in Cyprus, it's in high concentrations in the environment, in the environment, especially in the Nicosia district, and it's increasing. But recently, we completed the geographic distribution study in our country, and since we did not find any significant differences between the districts, for the moment, we put a, a waiting for this study. For cancer predisposition syndromes, we know that among the children uh, diagnosed with cancer in our department at the Aspicio Macarius Hospital, 10% uh, have cancer predisposition syndromes, but we cannot uh, calculate correctly what happens. It's one of our projects, and uh, we have to have population-based data. Now, concerning obesity and overweight, I draw your attention that a study in 2007 showed that pre-adolescents, 25% had either obesity and overweight. In 2022, 49% of our children, doubling of the, of the percentage in the seven till nine years old. So we had concurrent facts during the last two, three decades. Increased ASRW for childhood cancer, increased childhood obesity prevalence, and high prevalence of obesity in women and men uh, also. So what uh, increases, what is responsible for this phenomenon in Cyprus? Is it obesity? Okay, let me show you quickly some research data concerning the relations between obesity and adulthood cancer, obesity and childhood cancer, the Cyprus data, and what we are doing. What do the research data show? Before I delve into some uh, bibliography review, you all, all know that uh, our food has thousands of bioactive substances who function in many different ways in all our biological systems and they interact even with specific genes, they cause epigenetic changes, 
They intervene in genome regulation. They have genotoxic diet, uh, genotoxic effects. And of course, obesity as a dysregulation of uh, bad nutrition uh, can play a role. A reminder of, of the definition in the adults for overweight and obesity. In children, it's a bit different. We go according to percentile, according to age and sex to define what is uh, um, overweight or obese. We know that in the United Kingdom, for example, uh, the second biggest cause of cancer is um, obesity and is increasing with overweight and also with the time of being overweight. This is important. And healthy weight reduces the risk for 13 types of cancer. In this list of 20 cancers uh, who are related or associated or caused by obesity, I highlighted the three who we have problem in Cyprus, thyroid, lymphomas, and leukemias. There are many ways, I'm not going to delve into them, many biological uh, ways that explain uh, or try to uh, give an explanation between the relation of obesity and cancer. Uh, chronic inflammation, hormonal imbalances, insulin resistance, IGFN1, adipogens, and others. But let me uh, show you some recent uh, results about the relation between maternal obesity and high birth weight and childhood cancer. Study shows that uh, maternal obesity and high birth weight are associated to increased chances for childhood cancer. Maternal diet plays a role. So a maternal diet uh, who is rich in fruits or vegetables, or a mother who is supplemented with folic acid, less risk for uh, cancer in children, and also breastfeeding. Um, childhood uh, um, children who are uh, obese or overweight have much more chances to remain, the majority of them remain obese, and these uh, uh, obese adults uh, are more prone to present various kinds of cancers. Uh, also, um, there is um, evidence that uh, the children with uh, cancer uh, who become uh, obese in adulthood, the, the cancers that, I, that, that they develop are more serious and have uh, a less uh, uh, good uh, uh, outcome. Also, we know that among children who are diagnosed with cancer, those who are obese have much more chances to relapse and less, uh, more uh, problems and increased mortality. Um, also, uh, it seems that, uh, according to a study of the 2020, that children who are obese have much more chances to develop serious kinds of leukemias, especially those involved with CNS. Therefore, there is a suggestion for obesity and leukemogenesis relation. Another interesting study for us, uh, recent also, showed that obese individuals are at higher risk for thyroid malignancy, and in this case, insulin-related uh, mechanisms have, have, have been involved. Another very important uh, uh, new data, interesting for us, is that thymic involution, there are many uh, mechanisms through which thymic can be, uh, can involute, and this uh, um, uh, phenomenon decreases cellular immunity, and we know that uh, abnormalities in cellular immunity can uh, induce uh, cancer. So what about Cyprus? Let's see uh, the alarming data. Uh, a study of 2000 till 2010 showed that uh, there is constantly increasing trends of obesity in our children. Uh, another study in 2007 showed that one in of two adults is important, uh, and uh, one in four pre-adolescent children, 25, 25% uh, were either obese or overweight. And let's go to the WHO uh, study from 2015 till 2017. We see that 43% of our children, it doubled from before, uh, are obese and overweight, and 20% obesity. And let's see the last study that I'm presenting to you from 2020. And there you see Cyprus is the number one in the obesity of children is the first uh, column there. And this is very alarming because one out of our, of, of our uh, children, one, uh, one out of two, is either obese or overweight. And if we take only the obese, uh, we have almost 25%. So the Cyprus enigma and the question we try to answer now is, do obesity and overweight in children in Cyprus play a role in the overall increased incidence range of childhood cancer? And in the alarming annual percentage increase of 7.5% of thyroid cancer? 
So our study that we're doing now is retrospective and also a part of it, another one, prospective, more difficult. Reference group creation, of course, body weight, height, body mass index, and we want to answer the question of possible correlations, because as I said before, obesity is not yet proved as a cause of cancer of children, but we want to know what happens in Cyprus. Our team is from these people from abroad also, because we have an international team to do this. And this is what I, what I wanted to present to you about the Cyprus situation and childhood cancer. Thank you very much. Because we're running over time, not because of you, Professor Loiza, but the previous talkers, I think we're going to have to um, skip questions. So once again, I'd like to thank Professor Loiza for his excellent presentation and also the wonderful work he's been doing here in Cyprus for, for many years. Thank you, Professor Loiza. So, no questions. The third session will be about medical genetics as a tool for new therapies, blood malignancies, chronic and rare diseases. We would like now to call upon the chairs, Dr. Stefanos Christodoulidis and Dr. Panayota Christodoulou. We would like to welcome in the stage uh, Professor Dr. Kastern Werden Lederer. Uh, Dr. Lederer received his PhD from the University of East uh, Anglia, Norwich, in UK. Uh, he now holds the position of scientist at the uh, Molecular Genetic Thalassemia Department of the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics. Uh, where he heads the gene therapy and editing unit, Dr. Uh, Lederan, an associate professor and course coordinator at the Cyprus School of Molecular Medicine. Um, current associated research activities also include the model development for um, hematopoietic disorders and uh, investigating the role of mRNAs in uh, erythropoiesis. Dr. Lederer is author of 46 peer review articles with over 2,400 literature citations. Okay, cheers. I'll, I'll always be a scientist, I hope. So, uh, thank you very much for having me uh, here. So, I'm going to talk about genome editing of hemophilic cells for translational research. I'm not sure I'm going to take us back into the time frame because I think for that I'd need a time machine, but I'll, I'll do my best. To, uh, to stay within time. So I'll briefly talk about strategies for therapy, then about tools uh, for gene therapy, in particular for editing in a nutshell, um, then about e editing work we do in Cyprus and also some other things that we do in our department. And then I'll um, have a look into the future if I still have the time to do so. So because uh, our department is on uh, thalassemia, molecular genetics, uh, key to everything that I'm telling you now is hemoglobin that you see uh, that you see here. Uh, so two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and in adults that is the majority, of course, the vast majority of hemoglobin in your blood that transports oxygen and uh, and carbon dioxide. Um, if beta globin expression is broken, then we have uh, then we have beta hemoglobinopathies. Alternatively, there's also alpha uh, hemoglobinopathies. Uh, what is important to understand for therapeutic applications is that there's equivalence of alpha and beta-like globins in the genome. They're encoded on different chromosomes. So for alpha, in principle, we could use zeta instead. There's some differences in oxygen affinity and so on, but in principle, this might be therapeutic if this was activated when alpha is broken. For beta, there would be epsilon or the gamma chains or the delta chain instead that could take the place of beta um, and might be of therapeutic use. 
Um, now that's the basic idea, but unfortunately, um, nature uh, doesn't doesn't live up to up, up to this promise. There is uh, uh, the, there are hemoglobins that are expressed early on in development that actually express zeta instead of alpha, but unfortunately in adults these are not at all expressed, and uh, so far we have not found uh, how to induce them. So they could not be therapeutic in in, in adults. Uh, the same goes for epsilon, for for beta globin. However. If you see the expression uh, as it is in, in adults, the, uh, there's still some fetal hemoglobin, there's a secondary adult hemoglobin, and then this main hemoglobin, alpha 2, beta 2, expressed. It turns out delta is always low because the promoter is deficient, but gamma can actually express, can be expressed to high levels. And that is, for example, the case in hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, uh, where mutations on the beta locus lead to a persistent uh, expression of gamma globin. Uh, now, one approach of therapy would be to either mutate binding sites for repressors that repress gamma globin in adults, or it would be to, uh, to actually affect the repressors themselves, transcription factors that would then lead to uh, high gamma expression if knocked out. And as everywhere in life, breaking is easier, easier than fixing, so instead of fixing mutations, which we also do, uh, breaking repressors or breaking binding sites is actually much more efficient at the moment and is therefore a very promising uh, therapeutic approach that's also in clinical trials. Now for beta thalassemia, it's just important that, uh, for example, gamma globin works as a beta-like globin chain. For sickle cell disease, which is a very common disease, of course, in Africa related to thalassemias, it's important that gamma globin is also anti-cycling. So when we look at the pathophysiology of uh, alpha thalassemia, we've got uh, absence of alpha, toxic beta uh, homotetramers, and we could remove beta, uh, which would remove the toxicity, but then we would still have anemia. We could add alpha, that would be curative. We could repair alpha mutations, or we could activate the alpha-like Ziva globin. As I told you already, that is not possible uh, at the moment. Now, it turns out that if you have no alpha at all, you die in utero or uh, around about birth, which means it's a very difficult uh, disease to tackle uh, therapeutically. HBH disease, which is still one copy of alpha, is not lethal. So there's no, no pressing interest of, of developing therapies here. Also, most alpha thalassemia mutations are large and deletional, and it's difficult. So um, the scientific community and companies have decided that alpha thalassemia is not a priority at the moment. That's different for beta thalassemia, where beta expression is absent. We've got, uh, or reduced, uh, we've got alpha homotetromers that are toxic. If we remove alpha, we'd still end up with anemia again. However, we can add beta. That is in clinical trials and is already a product that was approved and then removed from the market in Europe as a gene therapy. We could repair the uh, thalassemia mutation. We could activate uh, beta-like uh, gamma globin. And all of these three would be therapeutic. Now, the problem is uh, that for thalassemia, there's hundreds of mutations that cause disease, as you'll see in our database, Ethernet, where we list uh, those hundreds of mutations as well. Uh, they can appear in homozygous and compound heterozygous form. So if you do uh, mutation-specific therapy, uh, you have a lot of work on your hand, and there's a lot of cost for research uh, going into a um, small number of patients. So companies and uh, academics prefer universal therapies that cover all of the mutations at the same time. Now, importantly, sickle cell disease is related to beta thalassemia, and that it also has mutations of beta, uh, globin, but it leads, to, uh, it leads to precipitation in low oxygen environments of the body that then leads to vasoclusion and so on. Um, you could remove the cycling beta, which is a toxic agent, but then you end up with beta thalassemia, so you just exchange one disease for the other. But once again, we could add uh, either an anti-cycling beta or gamma. We could uh, repair mm -hmm. the mutation, or we could activate gamma globin. So for sickle cell disease, we've got hundreds of thousands of patients, also in immigrant communities uh, in, in the US and so on, not just in Africa. We've got uh, a single mutation. And uh, if you design universal therapies that uh, add anti-cycling uh, beta-like globins or that activate gamma globin, you have a therapy that covers hundreds of thousands of patients. So that is quite lucrative for companies. And that's also currently the, the focus of, of uh, clinical trials. I won't go into clinical trials here because uh, there's not enough time in these, in these 20 minutes, but uh, basically uh, gene addition of an anti-cycling beta has been in clinical trials and approved, and what is currently the most successful clinical trial, and there's another six also going on. They all induce gamma globin as a therapeutic approach.
Okay, now we're also interested in this and the principle is, as I just pointed out, you, uh, you can modify modifiers of gamma globin, you can knock them out. This way you would then induce gamma globin and gamma globin is therapeutic for beta thalassemia and for, and for sickle cell disease. Now these transcription factors, unfortunately, don't just do one thing. They have multiple functions. So you have to fine tune how you knock them out and what you do. For example, V7A and ZPTV7A are very powerful gamma repressors. So knocking them out will activate gamma globin. But ZPTV7A is also required for the differentiation of red blood cells. So overall, that would be a bad strategy uh, for a red blood cell disease. BCL11A, BCL11A does not affect uh, the differentiation of red blood cells, but it is required for T and B cell survival. Uh, which has led to the idea of um, deactivating BCL11A only in the erythroid lineage. And uh, this way achieve, um, achieve gamma induction, but, um, but also keep T and B cells alive. The therapy, um, the strategies, how this can be done, we see BCL11A here. Um, and to, to, uh, to avoid uh, BC11A activating beta globin while keeping it uh, uh, active to, uh, to prevent apoptosis. Uh, might be to just knock it out altogether, but then you'd end up with gamma globin expression, which is great, but without an immune system, which is not so great. So the solution here is erythroid specific suppression, and this can be done by RNA interference. So you can uh, drive a, a short hairpin RNA from an erythroid specific promoter to suppress BC11A, or what we're also doing in our lab and what is currently in different clinical trials uh, for, for editing, uh, you can inactivate an, uh, an erythroid specific enhancer in BC11A, or you can disrupt uh, gamma globin promoter binding sites of BC11A that would then prevent uh, suppression of gamma globin. Now, very briefly, commonly used editors are zinc finger nucleases, TALEN and CRISPR. And I'll just focus on, on CRISPR now. We're also using TALEN, but importantly, CRISPR is very easy to use, very cheap to use. Uh, those who do lab work and still use shRNAs for suppression, I really I urge them to, to, to switch to CRISPRs. Uh, they're very simple to, to design. Uh, the only downside uh, of the first generation of CRISPRs was that they have a protospace adjacent motif that limits um, access to certain sites in the genome because you require this particular sequence that is protein encoded, whereas the rest is RNA encoded and can be freely modified. Um, now, the first generation of editors uh, it uses double strand breaks as a basis for repair. This uh, can be repaired by non homogeneous end joining or by homogeneous directed repair, which is, however, fairly in, uh, inefficient in hematopoietic uh, stem cells. And uh, whatever you do, there's always some, uh, some background of non-homologous end joining, but non-homologous end joining is always fairly effective and is, however, imprecise, so it leads to indels. That's great for, for, uh, for disruptions, but it's not great for uh, correction, for example, of open reading frames. Now, it's biology here, so even if you do HDR, you always get uh, non-homologous end joining as well. Double strand breaks can lead to recombination event and cancer. And editors might also inadvertently cut elsewhere, which is called off-target activity. Now, this has been addressed by newer editors uh, that are double-strand break independent. They just cause a nick. And not ignoring now RNA editing and, and transcription factors, uh, there's new editors that have uh, a vastly reduced PAM, so they cut almost everywhere, so uh, virtually PAMless. Base editors that perform chemical modification uh, and only rely on nicking of DNA, so they're much safer than, uh, than uh, double strand break based editors. Prime editing is much more flexible, but it's still not so easy to apply. And there's ever new developments which you can't go into for small editors, for in vivo delivery, for higher precision, for, uh, for higher efficiency, and uh, also now more flexible base editors. Now, what we're doing in Cyprus, we're using double strand break based editing and, and uh, base editing at the moment, and what we see here with Constantina, Petros, and, and, and Banayota, they're involved in, in double-strand break-based disruption of a Cypriot mutation that is a splice site um, that is aberrant, and if we disrupt this uh, aberrant splice site, we don't end up with the aberrant uh, product, but we end up with a proper beta-globin mRNA, and we've published this, so I'll, I'll, I'll rush through this, so uh, it's very good this, this way with this disruption, we get very good uh, correction of uh, mRNA expression, we get very good correction of beta-globin 
to alpha globin expression, also across uh, experiments and across samples for different patients, and we get very good correction of erythroid differentiation. So we get lots of late-stage erythroid cells indicative of working therapy. The trouble we had was that both when we used TALENS and CRISPR-Cas molecules, or RNA-guided endonucleases, we also had off-target sites, which of course in, in therapy would be a no-go, because then you might have recombination events, even if the uh, gene is not, not functional in erythroid cells. And we address this for TALEN, which I can't show you now, but we address this uh, for, for CRISPR-Cas by uh, testing a series of different high-fidelity editors so that have higher on-target uh, on efficiency uh, without, uh, without losing, uh, uh, without um, that lose off-target activity without losing on-target efficiency. And what was the crux now for our experiments was that in 2022, a TrueCut uh, was, was, uh, was made available as a new enzyme. And in comparison to, to other enzymes we use, like Alta, HiFi, and Sniper Cus, we want the orange event and we don't want the green event, which is the off-target uh, true cut, then led to really great uh, on-target efficiency, so correction, uh, and no detectable off-target efficiency. So we went ahead with this, and we're now, it induces beta globin very well. We're moving this, uh, and analyses are, are ongoing, into uh, immunodeficient mice in human cells to also see long-term repopulating cell uh, correction. Now, very briefly, we also perform double strand break based editing with HDR to uh, produce isogenic mutant models for uh, congenital erythropoietic anemia uh, with involvement of, of Banayota and also Nicoletta and, and, uh, and, and Lola uh, in, in, in the lab, and uh, we're in the process of isolating clones there. And importantly, we switch to base editing by, uh, by uh, em employing in vitro uh, transcription that was initially established in the lab by, by, by Nicoletta. We get very good efficiencies now, upwards of 80% for on-target editing. And what you see here is uh, Nicoletta editing uh, the BC11A erythroid enhancer, which gives uh, a, a, good, a good level of induction of, uh, of gamma globin. Uh, she also uh, disrupts the gamma globin promoter binding site, which also gives a good level of induction. However, when she disrupts both at the same time, and because these are double strand independent, um, that, is, that is safe, then she gets a superior induction of, of gamma globin. Uh, Basma uh, uses, uh, uh, uses base editors to correct the uh, HBB IBS110 mutation by base editors and targeting a specific uh, context uh, uh, nucleotide. She gets very good induction here from beta in the control to beta in, uh, in, in, in the treatment. If she does a neighboring base, we even get um, a suppression of beta globin, indicating that it's really critical you hit the right base close to, close to mutation. Two more slides and then I'm done. So if you know who this is, you're probably, um, you're probably too old, just uh, as I am, it dates me badly. So leveraging data. So we work on databases and on, and on knowledge development as well. So importantly, we've got the Ethernet portal where Petros and Coralia uh, work on. It's the most comprehensive database worldwide on, on hemoglobinopathies. It also covers epidemiology and uh, we don't have a photograph for her in here, but Michaela, she's also in the audience. She works on this and has a poster on her, on her work there. Uh, there's thousands of mutations we've stored together with frequencies, together uh, also with, uh, with, uh, with uh, to, um, preventive options for, for different countries. And this has been a tool for us to become uh, the very incubation expert panel for ClinGen uh, as, as coordinators. Uh, it has made us the Europe LUTNET registry developer uh, for, for an ERN. And also it has led us to, uh, to be involved in or to, to coordinate inherent as a project for modifier uh, discovery for hemoglobinopathies. And uh, Ethernet offers, for example, for all countries where anything has been published, uh, mutation frequencies and, uh, and also um, pol uh, policies on health development. Now here, this is, uh, this is Ether Maps shown here, and, uh, and Inherent is a network of over 200 researchers that we are coordinating in the department, uh, with, uh, spearheaded by Petros Gunduris. And we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to find modifiers for gamma globin uh, induction. Uh, and if you have samples, if you're an inter international guest here and you have uh, samples that would be of relevance, make sure to contact us. I won't look into the future now. I've run out of time. Uh, suffice it to say that there's many developments going on, including uh, going in utero, uh, including, uh, and that's very important, going in vivo instead of ex vivo therapy. And it remains for me to thank uh, all the folks in the department, uh, uh, Basma, uh, Sevier, and Florentia, as well as Miguel, as I pointed out, they've got posters. So find them if you can find them in, in the conference to talk to them about their, their fantastic work. 
And of course, I thank uh, our, our collaborators in the UK, in Germany, in uh, Greece, our doctors, and most of all, our patients, and you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Leder, for this uh, very interesting speech. So, any questions from the audience? Okay. So, thank you very much thank for you. your attendance. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I would like to welcome our next uh, presenter, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Anita Hileos. Uh, she's an assistant professor of embryology and histology, Department of Clinical Basin Sciences, University of Nicosia Medical School. Dr. Hileos obtained her BSc with honors in biology from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and completed her MSc as a Fulbright Scholar in Cell Biology at New York University School of Medicine, followed by a PhD in developmental genetics from New York University School of Medicine. She then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Stowers Institute for Biomedical Research in the lab of Dr. Paul Traynor in Kansas City, Missouri, after, after which she was a research associate at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, in the lab of Dr. Rose Posh. Dr. Achilleos is a developmental, uh, developmental biologist in, interested in the complex processes that control the intricate development of the craniofacial skeleton. Uh, her work has focused on neural crest cells, a multipotent cell population that uh, gives rise to the majority of the craniofacial skeleton during embryogenesis. As a postdoctoral fellow, she has used mouse and zebrafish models to study the pathophysiology of human craniofacial disorders, including treacher colin syndrome. And she has recently discovered a novel role for the, for the transcription factor running in craniofacial development of ribosome biogenesis. She is currently in the process of establishing a, zebra, a zebrafish facility, the first animal research and education facility at the University of Nicosia Medical School. She is planning to use zebrafish as the main model organism uh, on her research program, focusing on neural crest cells and their role in human craniofacial development and disease. So the title of your lecture today is The Molecular Dissection of Rare Disease Towards the Modeling of Fimbor Errors of Metabolism. So Dr. Achilleo, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers, in particular, uh, Dr. Patrigios, for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, share my work here with you. Um, it's my first uh, conference here, so I'm very excited uh, to participate. So today I'm going to give you um, uh, a brief over overview of our latest, um, uh, um, excuse me, our latest uh, um, data uh, results, uh, I should say, um, when it comes to uh, cobalamin metabolism um, disorder. Okay, so cobalamin refers to B12. And uh, so that would be the majority of my talk. And then in the end, I would touch upon our latest developments of establishing a zebrafish facility here uh, in Cyprus at the University of Nicosia. Okay? So um, we all know that vitamins are essential both for uh, development and proper homeostasis in adulthood. Right? And today, I will be focusing on vitamin B12, also known as uh, cobalamin. Okay. So uh, we also know that we intake most of the uh, uh, vitamins we need to take through uh, food sources, right? Um, but that, that's not it. We, most of the proteins, most of the vitamins that we uh, uh, get into our system, they are found in their inactive form. So our body needs to have the biochemical factory uh, in place to be able to, uh, to be able to um, convert them into their active form, okay? So in our case, uh, again, I'll be talking about vitamin B12. We get it uh, in our body in the inactive form, as shown here in these red uh, stars. And I'm not gonna go over the very nitty-gritty of the biochemical pathway of vitamin B12, but 
But all I'm going to mention is this enzyme MMACHC shown here. And what this enzyme does is to convert the inactive B12 into these two active forms, the methylcobalamin uh, here and adenosylcobalamin right here. So both of those act as coenzymes, okay? So one is required to convert homocysteine into methionine. And as we know, methionine is an essential amino acid required for many things in the cell. And adenosylcobalamin at the bottom in the mitochondrium is required to convert methymalonic acid to succinyl-CoA, and that fits into the production of energy, okay? So inborn errors of metabolism are actually congenital disorders caused by genetic mutations in enzymes that are part of these pathways that are required to convert, to make these uh, uh, vitamins into their active forms, okay? And so usually what happens if you have a defective enzyme due to a genetic mutation, you get accumulation uh, of specific substances, for example, here, homocysteine and MMA, that can be toxic to the body, and that um, results in the defects seen in these uh, deficiencies. Okay, so one of, the, um, um, one of the deficiencies, I guess, that I'll be talking about is this uh, vitamin B12 deficiency or cobalamin deficiency disorder, and uh, it was found that uh, mutations in this specific enzyme I talked about, MMSHC, cause this uh, disorder, okay? So what happens is that you have um, inactive MMSHC, so you cannot transform homocysteine into methionine, so you get accumulation of homocysteine. You can convert MMA into succinyl so you get uh, accumulation of MMA, and uh, these, are thought to, these accumulations are thought to be toxic to the cell, okay? So because of accumulation of these substances, this specific disorder is called methymalonic aciduria and homocysteinuria CBLC type, okay? So this is uh, a rare disorder. It's about one in 200,000 births. It's very severe, a multi-systemic uh, disease characterized by growth, uh, fetal delay, uh, severe uh, brain malformations, anemia, as well as renal cardiac defects, among other um, defects, okay? So now, why do, how did we get involved into cobalamin deficiency disorder? Like many times in science, this, uh, we kind of came by accident. It was more of an organic uh, a progression into the disease uh, because we're mostly interested in this uh, gene called Ronin and its cofactor HCF1. So Ronin is a transcription factor required in embryonic stem cell pluripotency and mammalian development in general. So in our efforts to understand this transcription factor uh, in mammalian development, we discovered that uh, it actually directly um, um, activates MMA, uh, controls MMACHC. And remember, that's the en enzyme that uh, causes cobalamin deficiency disorder. Uh, due to this relationship, we decided to further investigate Ronin and its cofactor HCFC1 in cobalamin uh, uh, deficiency disorder, okay? So when we started doing that, it turns out that there's actually mutations in HCFC1 and Ronin that found in human patients with cobalamin deficiency disorder, okay? So mutations in HCFC1 um, causing that disease, uh, they named the disease CBLX because that gene is on the X chromosome. Later on, uh, mutations in Ronan were identified causing a very similar disease, and that was called CBLX-like, okay? Interestingly, both of these uh, uh, diseases, we were both cobalamin deficiency, they are very similar to the CBLC I talked about earlier, but they are more severe, okay? So we decided to further uh, understand the pathophysiology behind cobalamin deficiency disorder because as many rare disorders is not very well known. So we decided to make the first mouse models of CBLX and CBLX-like disorders. So we used CRISPR-Cas9 and made uh, a model with uh, a mutation in Ronan and a mutation in HCFC1. Both of those mutations are the exact same mutations we, find, we found uh, in humans, in human patients. So the first thing we did was to see whether vitamin B12 was actually deficient. There's a deficiency in these uh, mice, okay? And indeed, we found that 
the uh, active forms of B12 in the cell uh, were lower, okay? And because those uh, active uh, coenzymes were lower, we failed to make the conversion from homocysteine to methionine and MMA to succinyl-CoA, so we have accumulation of homocysteine and MMA, uh, which is the very, is a biochemical uh, profile of patients with uh, cobalamin disorder. So now that we have established that we have cobalamin deficiency in these mice, we went on to see uh, what do their phenotypes resemble the human, uh, uh, the defects we see in human patients, and indeed we did. Very briefly, I'll just mention that we saw severe uh, uh, brain uh, defects, such as hydrocephaly and thinning of the neocortex, thinning of the neocortex suggesting uh, defects in neurogenesis, and we have some data suggesting that we have that as well. We found cardiac defects, such as um, left ventricular non-compaction and anemia, and specifically megaloblastic anemia, and these, both the cardiac and the uh, anemia defects are, are, are seen in human patients, as well as in neurodevelopmental as well. So now we have a model that resembles the, uh, the phenotypes or the defects we see in human patients, so we're able to uh, start looking more into what goes wrong into these cells to give us those phenotypes. So uh, to find more about the targets of Ronan, because Ronan is a transcription factor, so we did a transcriptomics analysis. We had uh, ChIP-seq and RNA-seq, and to our surprise, we found a large cohort of genes um, required for ribosome biogenesis. Remember, the ribosome is what translates all the proteins. So we found a large cohort of these uh, genes that were differentially expressed between our control and our mutant mice. So, uh, so have, uh, we think we have defective ribosomes, so we went ahead to look at some functional studies, and by functional studies, uh, we found that uh, ribosomes are actually defective. We found then that because the ribosomes were defective, translation of proteins was also defective. Interestingly, um, translation was higher in general, was higher in mutants than in control, and um, uh, consequently, not consequently, but Parallel to that, we found that all those proteins that were more expressed higher, uh, if you will, they were actually also ubiquitinately, which means that most of those proteins that were expressed in these high rates were probably not of good quality. So they were being degraded, okay? All right, so we, are, we are discovered, we, are, we uncovered a ribosome defect in these cobalamin deficiency models as well, okay? So now we went back uh, to our uh, mutants and we looked more carefully at phenotypes and we found that a lot of the phenotypes were phenotypes that were correlated with uh, defects in ribosome biogenesis. And there's um, a group of, of um, excuse me, diseases in humans called ribosomopathies, okay? And these are disorders caused by uh, mutations leading to dysfunction of the ribosomes in ribosomal genes, okay? Uh, one of the uh, famous is uh, craniofacial syndrome, such as Trisha Collins syndrome, and diamond black fan anemia, which is another um, a type of anemia whose ribos has some uh, ribosome defect. But anyway, to make a, a long story short, we found uh, in our mice this, uh, we have pigmentation defects. All these are related to ribosome uh, biogenesis defects. Hypopigmentation, craniofacial defects, uh, skeletal defects such as polydactyly, these homeotic transformations that happen during uh, development, uh, and so on. So now we have, uh, we think we have uncovered a new um, aspect of the pathophysiology of cobalamin deficiency disorder. So based on our models, we um, were able to show that yes, indeed, on one part, there is a reduction in uh, the active form of cobalamin, of RNB12, and that leads to a gr a certain uh, characteristics of this disease. But then we have uncovered a new role um, of these two genes in ribosome biogenesis. So an aspect of cobalamin deficiency may also be uh, um, a ribosomopathy. So the underlying uh, causes, I should say, uh, may be also be due to a ribosomopathy, okay? So uh, as you can imagine, if this holds true in humans, uh, it can change the way that patients with cobalamin deficiency can be treated 
uh, by doctors because right now the treatments of covalent deficiency patients are not very efficient. And maybe because there are some other underlying cause that uh, we just started um, uh, discovering now. Okay, so for this part, I would like to thank, so all this work was done in the Poche lab at Baylor College of Medicine uh, in Houston and with all of our collaborators. And I wanna leave you uh, with the last 39 seconds um, with our newest developments at the University of Nicosia Medical School and invite everybody that is interested, of course, to come and talk to me, interested in working with zebrafish. Um, it doesn't need too much introduction, but zebrafish, um, it's a very well-established model. There's about more than 1,000 uh, labs around the world working with zebrafish um, in development, cancer, uh, neurobiology, toxicology, you name it, genetics. You can use it uh, for everything. Uh, their embryos are very transparent. We have uh, high genetic homology to humans, sequenced genome. And here I'm just showing how transparent these embryos are. So you can do uh, developmental biology studies very easily. Uh, this is very rapid development. High uh, throughput screening, small molecule, your drug of interest, uh, toxicity uh, that you, you wanna look at and you can, it's easy to see uh, defects or phenotypes that you're looking at. And also for educational purposes, since the early embryogenesis of zebrafish is very similar to human, we're planning to use that uh, in our education as well. And they're transparent, so you can easily stain and see organs through the whole embryo. So here is the heart. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank the people that um, are currently working with me and establishing uh, this facility. Constantinos Voskaridis, uh, Andreas Haralambus, Chachu Bulla Makridis, and uh, the funding from the University of Nicosia. And thank you for your patience and for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Achilleos, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we have uh, time for only one question. If there is one. Okay, so thank you one more time for thank the you. very uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. We would like now to call upon the chairs Professor Dimitris Papadopoulos and Professor Konstantinos Lampropoulos. So good morning to all from us, and thank you for being here. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Professor Giorgos Spiru. Uh, Professor Spiru is the chair of bioinformatics uh, uh, of the European Research Area and the head of the bioinformatics group at the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics. So uh, Professor Spiru is going to talk to us about the framework of network medicine and the space of bioinformatics within it. Uh, Professor Spiru, would you like to, to start? Yes, We're thank you very much for the kind introduction and the you invitation. Your work. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I will talk today about the framework of network medicine and uh, what is it uh, and how it is combined with bioinformatics and we, what it can offer. Actually, network medicine is a part or a view of the, what is called precision medicine, personalized medicine. And if we search in uh, PubMed, uh, looking for this term, at least in the titles of the papers, we will see that it started more or less on 2007 uh, with a burst of publications, a first burst of around 2010-12, uh, and then it goes uh, upper and upper. Um, so um, we can 
see also that uh, we have uh, previously terms like network biology, uh, network pharmacology, and networks in general, and uh, when combined with bioinformatics, we, th we see that uh, we have um, a great trend nowadays. So the first paper that uh, we see, Network Medicine, the title, uh, comes from uh, Albert Barabasi at 2007, and uh, from uh, the same year, 2007-2008, from uh, other colleagues. Uh, and then in 2012, and around these years, Albert Barabasi again and Joel Oscalzo uh, and other colleagues tried to elaborate more on what is network medicine and why it is useful and how it can, what it can offer in the new vision of precision medicine. So other terms came up, systems pharmacology, um, systems proteomics, uh, translational network medicine, and nowadays, in 2023, we see again an di even deeper view and application of network medicine, trying to uh, approach complexity in kidney disease phenotypes, or trying to use multiomics in this net network medicine framework to tackle uh, complex diseases, or even to bring together uh, mechanism-based molecular and endotypes and AI together with networks in order to boost the precision medicine vision. So from the fundamental papers, uh, if we see some initial key points, we can keep that uh, actually it is a common sense nowadays that disease phenotypes reflect various pathobiological processes that interact in a complex network. And these networks, they have organizing principles that govern cellular um, mechanisms and processes. And then uh, these principles and the topology of the networks, they may have implications in our understanding of the disease under study. So they can highlight in a systemic way genes and uh, drugs uh, that uh, can be crucial and significant uh, against a disease. Also, some findings uh, coming from this aspect uh, are that disease genes, they seem that they have a propensity to cluster together in the uh, neighborhood of a network, protein-protein interaction network, for example. And um, we can see modules of networked genes as biomarkers and not single genes. So we, we are looking for relationships as biomarkers and not only molecular entities. And going more and more, uh, uh, we can see that there are uh, decisions, so disease to disease networks, a map of all the diseases that uh, can be connected together based on similar findings, similar uh, genes, um, common phenotypes, comorbidities, etc. So in in this track, where we try to be more precise, so we try to combine uh, findings from every level uh, of data, from uh, the standard tests, the drugs that we are taking, but uh, our electrophysiological measurements, our imaging, our lifestyle, our omics, uh, bulk omics and single cell even omics, when we are collecting, connecting and analyzing them, we try to bring together and to construct a profile. But even then, we need to take into account that we are not alone. So we, we are inside an ecosystem, so we try to capture also the, what is called exposome. And now we don't talk only about one network, but for network-to-network -network interactions. Bioinformatics come to advance themselves and be systems of informatics or network based by informatics, trying to tackle all these uh, challenges in dealing with complex data, interrelated data, in order to build uh, profiles. And uh, they try to give uh, some solutions in the integration of the data, trying to interrelate and study within the layers and across the layers in order to generate profiles. Wh why are these profiles crucial? They are crucial because if they are good, they will be a, a critical stepping stone for good AI systems. Good AI systems mean that we will have a very good computer-aided diagnostic help or computer-aided therapeutic 
uh, help in um, generating new drugs or repurposing new drugs. But I am talking about network, so let's see what is a network. Actually, in its abstract form, a network is a visualization of relationships among a set of entities, whatever. So if we have a set of entities and we define a question of relationship between them, we have a network. And these networks in biological uh, and uh, medical level can be of various types, gene regulatory networks where genes activate or inhibit other genes, protein-protein interaction networks where we have physical interactions between the proteins, drug-to-gene target networks, and uh, very interesting disease-to-disease -disease networks based on various questions of similarity between the diseases. Where can we find this information to construct the networks? Actually, we have two broad categories, and evidence-based molecular networks where we mine from um, curated databases uh, and we try to uh, connect the entities based on the information that we mine from the databases. Or if we have omics at hand, then we can analyze them and statistically infer connections between the findings based on various uh, statistical uh, metrics like uh, uh, person's correlation coefficient, uh, mutual information, and other metrics that we can use to generate connectivity between the nodes. And what is after? If we construct this network, so behind the network, it is always a matrix of numbers that describes these relationships. And we can see that with the same players, the A, B, C, D, E, uh, we can see that we have one topology or another based on the matrix that is behind, actually based on the answers of the, uh, regarding the question of relationship that we have set. So we see that node E in the first place is not so significant, whereas node E in the second uh, stage, it is significant because it connects everything. Um, in this, uh, let's say, line of thought, we can understand that multi-connected nodes acting as hubs or nodes that are in between modules acting as uh, bridges. Uh, they can highlight it through network science analytics, through mathematics, graph theory, and then we can have quantified metrics, network centralities, to see what are the significant players in a systemic network level. And then we can proceed more to find dense regions in the network or um, networks that um, uh, are robust or not, depending on what we are um, looking at. For example, we can ask how susceptible is a network to failure, both from random and strategic attack. And this depends largely on the topology of the network. If we have a hierarchical network, then if we destroy the hubs, then we will uh, destroy the network. Um, so depending on the type of the network that we have and also on the type of the attack that uh, we are studying, um, we will have the answer of robustness. Uh, please take into account also that an attack in the network is also a drug treatment. So we have attacks like mutations in the networks that we are studying, but also we can attack ourselves to the network, to the disease network, to cure it. In this framework, let's see uh, in a nutshell what we are doing at CBIG at the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics Bioinformatics Department. Uh, so we try to use network to infer pathways that are missing from our initial pathway analytics. So we try to bring inside the missing links to achieve connectivity in our pathway-to-pathway -pathway networks and then to generate connected functional stories to understand better what is happening uh, with the clusters of the mechanisms that are related to the disease. We can integrate a priori knowledge together with omics to build synthetic gene-to-gene -gene networks in order to have, let's say, a network image of what we know up to now and what our, our omics say about our uh, disease. And uh, from this gene-to-gene -gene network, we can generate maps, maps that can drive, for example, random walkers inside a pathway-to-pathway -pathway network to reveal communities. What I'm saying this time is that if we uh, travel 
to the same uh, network twice, and uh, the first time we have one map uh, that is related to, uh, let's say, one disease, and uh, the second time we have another map related to another disease, then if we ask about the over-visited uh, regions of uh, this uh, network, then the first time we will have communities on the network that are related to the first disease, and the second time we have communities that are related to the second disease. So we will have related pathways uh, that they are um, somehow, um, let's say, related to the disease that was the map that um, was the, dri the driving force in this uh, walking over the network. We applied this methodology in the COVID era and actually we selected what was then the available information. We generated a synthetic gene-to-gene -gene network like this and with this synthetic gene-to-gene -gene network at hand, we tried to perform random walks and to highlight communities of connected pathways that could be related to um, the pathophysiology and the mechanisms that are related to COVID. And from there, we tried to highlight repurposed drugs that are related to these um, highlighted communities of uh, pathways. Uh, in another line of thought, we, we try to use all this expertise on systems by informatics to investigate whether we can have monotonicity on the fault changes of differentially expressed genes uh, across stages of colon cancer. So if we have a disease that has stages, for example, colon cancer, and then if we analyze the, gene, the transcriptomic profile at each, at each stage, then we can have differentially expressed genes, but then we can have monotonically expressed genes as well. So these genes are the genes that are systematically up or down towards the progression of the disease. And these monotonically expressed genes, they are related to monotonically expressed pathways. And from there, we can go for repurposing of drugs, finding drugs that they reverse this monotonicity. So we try to use this monotonicity to find drugs that are reversing this, and so we hopefully believe that this, uh, these types of drugs, they will reverse the progression of the disease. If we take transcriptomic profiles uh, from several diseases that are behind a common phenotype, like the fibrotic diseases, then uh, we can detect mechanisms and genes that characterize the background phenotype of various diseases. Here we took 13 different fibrotic diseases. We uh, separately analyzed each one uh, in terms of differentially expressed genes, uh, pathways related to them, and repurposed drugs, and we constructed disease networks. So this, the nodes are the 13 fibrotic diseases, and from there, we try to generate disease-to-disease -disease networks based on several questions, based on they are common overexpressed genes or based on the common underexpressed genes, they are common pathways, etc. And the usefulness of these subnetworks um, could be a more focused drug repurposing strategy in order to see whether we can pass one drug from one disease to another based on the connectivity that we um, discovered. Talking about networks, if our hypothesis is correct and we have a, w a way to describe in a network level the condition of the disease, then uh, if we have networks at each stage, for example, now here we see networks that are related to Alzheimer stages. If we have networks, then we can uh, describe and we can measure the differentiation of the networks across staging. So we try to find not only the genes that are differentiated, but also the edges that are differentiated. And this way, we hope that we will establish a method that will uh, find relationships as biomarkers and not only genes and proteins as biomarkers. Talking about exposome, just to say that uh, this um, systems by informatics approaches give also the opportunity to uh, generate 
network-network -network interactions and to see, for example, how viral proteins, they interact with host proteins and how they can reach actually proteins that are related to uh, specific diseases that we believe that are related to um, a, a virus. Uh, for example, multiple sclerosis and Epstein-Barr uh, infection. So we try to work also with the interface between uh, viruses and, and host uh, using this framework of networks. I will finish saying that um, uh, our department works now for about seven years, funded by the EU, uh, hosting the European Research Area Chair. Uh, we try to act uh, as a hub of excellence in the field of applied bioinformatics, trying to support preventive, personalized, and precise medicine. We love to work with complexity, networks, AI, to analyze potential biomarkers and candidate repurpose drugs. And uh, now on, we are uh, participating to two EU-funded uh, um, grants, uh, LMAMI, that deals with the progression of multiple myeloma, and we are going to apply all these uh, and many more applications uh, to um, analyze and to understand what is happening from the progression from non-symptomatic cases to symptomatic for multiple myeloma. And similar to this, we are participating in Comfort Age regarding the prediction, monitoring, and personalized recommendations for uh, Alzheimer's. And uh, we will have the analysis of a cohort here in Cyprus uh, based on uh, our methods and together with two other uh, clinics uh, in our department. Finishing, I would like to say that uh, all these works and many more that were not shown here, uh, they are all done because we have an excellent team, and I am uh, thankful to my colleagues um, that they are participate in this department. They are an inter interdisciplinary team, and uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to support the vision of precision and network medicine. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Professor Spiru. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? I'm afraid, uh, Professor Spiru, that uh, the audience is stunned <laughs> because we're talking about uh, very groundbreaking work uh, and a all completely new approach to diagnostics and therapeutics. So mm -hmm. at least I am stunned. Thank <laughs> I you very much. Thank so you. Thank, you, thank you so much for being thank here you. today. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Miltiadus for the next uh, uh, speech. Dr. Miltiadus has uh, graduated her Bachelor in Biology in Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and Master of Science in Imperial Host College London of Human Molecular Genetics. Since uh, two, uh, 2010, she has been working at Karais Kaikyo Foundation for the Diagnosis of Rare uh, Diseases. Uh, the title of the lecture is the Cyprus Genome Reference, a useful tool for research and diagnostic uh, use. Dr. Miltiadus, the floor is Thank yours. You. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andri Miltiadus, and today I will present to you the Cyprus Genome Project, which is an initiative, for to, which is an initiative to build the reference for the genetic variation of the Cypriot population. A few words about DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing has witnessed significant progress from 2003 when the first human genome was um, um, sequenced and published. This was a feat that lasted for 13 years and cost around $3 billion. Fast forward to 2023, we can sequence a whole genome in less than a day. It's obvious that we are overcoming technology and cost obstacles, and we are shifting towards an era of data generation, analysis, and interpretation. Of course, more data mean more challenges. When we are analyzing the exome data of a patient in our laboratory, we often encounter thousands of variants, and we are often called to ask a very simple and quite challenging question. Which of those variants are clinically significant and could be related to disease? 
It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So in order to answer this question, we classify the variants we detect based on their characteristics. If the variant is located on a conserved region or a critical domain for function, whether the variant is missense or whether it changes the reading frame of the protein, whether the variant is de novo, meaning absent from the parental samples, whether it's a known variant, known to cause disease and published in literature, and last but not least, whether this variant is present or not in the general population. And when I mean general population, I mean healthy population. So the rarity of a variant in a population is an indication of possible pathogenicity. So let's have an overview of the genome aggregation database, in short, GNOMAT. GNOMAT is the most widely accessed reference population data set in the world. It totals maybe hundreds of thousands of individuals containing frequencies of variants uh, in those individuals across the world. This database is highly, highly enriched for uh, individuals that um, are Europeans. Um, as we can see on, the, can you hear me? No. As we can see on this graph, half of the individuals uh, present in the GROMAT database are Europeans, followed by Latin and admixed American, South Asians, and East Asians. It's clear that GNOMAT database underrepresents a lot of population in the world, a lot of populations in the world. It's inevitable. It's a global scale database. So there are initiatives from hundreds of regions around the world to map their own genome and characterize their own populations. I'm not gonna go into many of them. I'm just gonna mention Africa. Um, Africa is quite diverse. It has many ethnic groups. They are about to sequence three million genomes, the, the so-called three million genome project. But just a preliminary analysis on their data has found at least three million unique variants. That means that three million variants are absent from GNOMAT database. I think it's around 10%. 10% of their variation is unique. So what about Cyprus? We are located in Europe but we're also located in the crossroads of three continents. We have 70 centuries of complex history. We all know we had prolonged periods of occupation, large immigration waves due to tourist development, and increase in mixed marriages. It goes without, not, without doubt that such interactions have resulted in the gradual transfer of genetic material and making our genetic makeup highly admixed. Okay, um, if we now see the frequency of the European HLA ancestral haplotype across many parts of the world, we can see that northern and western countries of Europe have a very high frequency of this uh, haplotype, whereas Cyprus has, is not, where this haplotype is not as common in Cyprus as someone would expect. If we now plot these countries from west twist, we can see that the frequency of this haplotype in Cyprus lies towards the lower end, closer to the Middle Eastern region. So it's quite obvious that we're genetically closer to the east that, rather than to the west. Um, this graph further emphasizes this um, uh, conclusion. Uh, what we did is that um, we got the uh, data from 30 separate individuals and we asked we ask the following question. How many novel coding variants were present within a Cypriot's individual exome? And by novel, I mean absent from GNOMAT and any other database known. We noticed that each individual, each Cypriot individual on average carried out 80 novel variants on average. What was more interesting though is that when we, see, when we saw the similar graph for Cypriots with at least one parent with European origin, we saw that 
this, the number of these novel variants were, was significantly lower. And this again emphasizes the fact that Cypriot variants deviate from European variants. Yeah, so. So I, I hope I convinced you that we need a local genetic reference. Obviously, our population it's, has a complex history. It has shaped its own genetic makeup. And of course, knowing the genetic characteristics of our population allows to discriminate the rare variants that might be associated with disease from the common and often benign variation in that population. It also allows to optimize some genetic test panels that are designed for pharmacogenetic testing on patients based on the most common variants that are associated to drug response in the population. Um, so we've talked about why we need a local genetic reference. Now I'm gonna go on a quick overview of the Cypress Genome Project cohort. Our cohort consisted of 10,000 healthy volunteer donors that were selected randomly. They're self-identifying as Cypriots, unbiased of gender and age. And a few words about the Cyprus exome dataset and the methodology. The methodology is called PoolSec, and what the principle behind it is that we took 10 pools of DNA from 1,000 individuals each that were created to form a cohort of 10,000 individual DNA samples in total. 10,000 different people. What we did then was we uh, exome sequenced these patients, uh, these, sorry, uh, these individuals uh, with whole exome probes, and of course, we all wanted to enrich uh, some um, genes that are of interest. So we used also gene specific probes for actionable genes, for tier one genes for hereditary cancer genes and for pharmacogenetic, for pharmacogenetic genes. Uh, we then aligned them to Human Genome 19. We analyzed them separately and all together. We merged them and we created a pooled sequence database where then the variant calling was performed and validation and error checking led to the creation of the variant database. Uh, I'm not a bioinformatician, so um, I cannot go through the details of the bioinformatics, uh, but stringent thresholds for coverage, base quality, variant allele frequency, and statistical significance were used on the replicability of findings across those 10 runs of people. Let's get a, few, uh, a fast overview of the Cypress Genome Project. You can see the link behind, below, so you can access it for free. Um, uh, if you want to search, let's say, for the RS number of your SNP or generally any variants that are found in your gene, you can search for the gene of interest, the chromosomal location, or the RS number. Let's say we're searching for the, with the RS number. It will direct you to the location of the SNP, and it will give you information about uh, the variance uh, frequency in the population and the variance frequency in GNOMAD, also data about whether it's found in CLINVAR or not, and a prediction of pathogenicity, as you can see on the right-hand side of the table. You can also get uh, information about the confidence this variant was called, based on uh, the replicability of the findings uh, across the 10 pools of, in, uh, individual, in 10 pools of um, DNA. Um, okay, so a few words about the cross-validation studies we performed. So uh, we were curious to see how the data of our 10,000 Cypriot exomes that were pulled compared to 3,000 Cypriot exomes that were sequenced singly. So what we did is we selected 400 SNPs scattered across the genome, ranging from 1% to 70%, and we compared the frequencies of these variants between the two cohorts. We noticed that there was a very high concordance of variant allele frequency between the two groups. 
We also selected SNPs that were published in literature in control cohorts, and we again plotted them against the frequencies of the variants found in our population. What we found is again the same, a very high concordance between the SNPs identified in the two cohorts. And then we went to answer a very interesting question. How much of those variants that we found in our population were novel? How much of this variation was not found in any other database published? We found by, by putting very strict um, thresholds and taking variants that were more than 5,000, had more than 5,000 read depth, we found that 10%, that is one in 10 variants of our population was not in GNOMAD and had no RS number, meaning that it had never been described before. Around 0.5 to 1% of this novel variation was in coding region, and 15% of this novel variation located on OMIM genes. I'd also like to stress here that this novel variation was uh, more than 50 or 60% non-synonymous. So we did have synonymous, but the majority were non-synonymous variants. And they were 25% of them, more than 5% in the population. So just closing conclusions, it's crucial to know the common variation in your population if you want to study rare disease, if you want to do research, if you want to do, know the evolutionary history of your population. And generally, it's very important when you're studying genetics in your population. Cyprus is an island with a mixed genetic makeup. It's genetically closer to east than to the west. And populations like Cyprus that are not represented in global genetic databases should have their own local genetic reference. So Cyprus Genome Project is a very useful, freely available tool for anyone that wants to do diagnosis and research. Uh, at this point, I would like to especially thank Dr. Athos and Dr. Cameron for doing the bioinformatics and statistics analysis, and Dr. Paris, who is here with us, and uh, Dr. Paul Costeas, uh, the scientific director of Karaiskagio Foundation, uh, Yorgo Zalovidis, a student that was kind enough to gather all the raw data of this project, and of course the molecular diagnostic team, which I'm really proud to be a member of. Thank you so much. <laughs> Greetings from Sanger. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miltiadus, for the excellent presentation. Uh, I think we are out of time. If we have one question, yes, please. Can we give the microphone, please? I have a question about the Cypriot cohort. You mentioned that anyone who self-identifies as Cypriot is eligible to uh, be a genotype. Um, does that include people that were born in Cyprus or Cypriots that live abroad? Could you give us some context? Um, your question is whether uh, if someone self-identifies as Cypriot, if they can register in the bone marrow donor registry, what is your question? Yeah, something like that. Like anyone who self-identifies as Cypriot can be part of the project. Okay, I'm going to give you some details about it. So the cohort was built based on 10,000 healthy volunteer donors that had registered for the bone marrow donor registry that we have in our foundation. So they were not purpose, purposefully uh, taken for that specific project. They had already been registered as bone marrow volunteer donors. But yes, if your question is whether, whether if you self-identify as Cypriot, whether you can register as bone marrow donor volunteer, yes, of course. We, we, we don't recruit. We, we yeah, my question was, is it anyone born in Cyprus? Like, what is the definition of a self-identifying Cypriot? 
Is there anyone born on the island? Is it Cypriots that live abroad? Like, are there requirements to be? Yeah. Any other questions? No, I think uh, we're finished. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mildiavos, for uh, Thank you. the work. And Thank you for, for having me here. There will now be a satellite session sponsored by Philip Morris International. We would like now to call upon the chairs, Professor Cristina Cusparu and Professor Elpida Niki Emanuel Nicolussi. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us to chair, along with Professor Emmanuel Nicolussi, uh, the session sponsored by Philip Morris International. I'd like to call to the stand Professor David Kayat, uh, a medical oncologist in Paris. He's heading the medical oncology at the hospital PTS Salpedier for 20 years in Paris in France. He gained his Master's of Science in Immunology from Paris and completed his PhD again in Tumor Immunology at the University Pierre and Marie Curie. He's a member of ASCO, Board of Directors for several years and organized um, the French Federation of Medical Oncologists of which he was elected the first president. He's Professor Emeritus of several institutions, including the Suxiu Institute for Oncohematology in China, amongst others. He is a member of several editorial boards and was an associate editor for the Journal of Clinical Oncology. In this case, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Therabondos and uh, Philip Morris International for allowing us to hear uh, this interesting presentation, the title of which uh, will be announced by Professor Nicolous. The title of the lecture of Professor Kayat will be Evaluating the Lung Cancer Risk <coughs> Reduction Potential of uh, Novel Tobacco and uh, Nicotine Containing Products, a matter of those response. Professor Kajat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear chairwoman. And it's a great honor for me to lecture in uh, this uh, uh, European um, University of Cyprus. So, um, um, so for those who do not know me, uh, I, I am considered as uh, one of the most rigorous fighter against smoking. So it looked like a, it's a bit strange for many of you that I'm gi giving this lecture and I disclose my conflict of interest because I am consultant to Philip Morris International. But as you can imagine, as the, the founder uh, of the field of medical oncology for the last 50 years, uh, I'm not working with them on cigarettes, but only on what we call arm reduction. And I'm going to explain you what it is. During my career, I have been appointed as the health um, advisor of the president, the French president Jacques Chirac, uh, from 2002 to 2006, and uh, I was in charge of uh, launching a huge uh, national control um, cancer plan, uh, very well funded, 2.2 billion euros for five years. I set up the French National Cancer Institute, and among the things I had to do as the president of this. Uh, a national Institute was I had to struggle against tobacco smoking because France among the 27 countries in Europe has one of the highest um, uh, tobacco prevalence. So uh, following the advice 
published by the WHO, I increased the cost of a pack of cigarettes for the first time in the history of my country from three to four and four to five euros per pack of cigarettes within less than two years. This very significant and very rapid increase in the cost of cigarettes induced the, um, the decrease of the number of smokers in France by almost 1.8 million. So we could be happy for that. And this induced a decrease in the sales of cigarettes in France from 80 down to 55 billion stick a year. I became the worst enemy of all the tobacco industry at that time. And in order to continue the struggle against tobacco smoking, I wrote and made voted by the French Parliament the law to ban smoking in public places. So when I left my job in 2006, I was quite happy. Unfortunately, on that field at least, uh, unfortunately, a few years later, we found out that this, almost all of these 1.8 million smokers who quitted went back to tobacco smoking. The reason, as a medical doctor, is very simple. It's an addiction, and it's not that easy to quit. And I'm going to show you that. So we are going to go through different parts of, uh, of the story of the relationship between tobacco smoking and cancer and how we can reduce the risk. Let me tell you, first, before we come to harm reduction, I want to go through three things that we are totally sure of. One is what is a cancer. To make it very simple, cancer is an unlimited and uncontrolled proliferation of mutated cells, and that these unrepaired mutations are usually related to the effect of an exposure to carcinogen. As you know, 5% of cancers in Europe are due to are hereditary because the, 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 the embryo got a gene that was uh, not normal from one of his parents, like BCR1 for breast cancer, but 95% of cancers are what we call sporadic and are due to the effect of an exposure to a carcinogen. And the second thing we know out of the three things I want to come up is that cancer is a major public health issue. If you look at uh, cancer belongs to what we call non-communicable disease. Non-communicable disease is, uh, is uh, one of the most important causes of death, including in Cyprus. These are numbers from your country. The non-communicable disease burden is 8.3 thousand deaths a year in Cyprus. 91% of them are due to non-communicable disease, which, is, which are uh, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory disease, diabetes, and cancer. 23% of the, of the deaths in Cyprus every year are due to cancer. Why such a high number, such a high prevalence of NCDs and of cancer? Because there is a huge tobacco prevalence in uh, Cyprus, 36%, but if you look at males, 52%, plus physical inactivity, almost one out of two uh, Cyprian, um, Cyprian citizens, obesity, and so on. So, if we look at the type of cancer we have in this country, we have prostate and breast, as everywhere else, but if you look at the other kind, many of them are tobacco-related cancer, including head and neck, lung, the esophageal, gastric, pancreatic, bladder cancer, for instance. The, the, the third point I wanted to, to clarify is that it's due to, cancer is, is due to mutation, unrepaired mutation on cells, is a major public health issue, and what are the conditions for a cancer to happen? What is very important to understand the concept of harm reduction is that you have to understand that between the, the notion, the idea of an exposure to a carcinogen and the onset of a cancer, there is a story of dose response. What does that mean? It means that the greater the amount of carcinogen you are exposed to, the higher the risk of cancer. What does that mean? For instance, staying under the sun for one hour and being a fisherman and staying under the sun all the day, every day, you're not going to have the same risk for skin cancer. Uh, being, getting an irradiation because you do a CT scan or a mammogram and being exposed to Chernobyl or to Fukushima is not the same risk of leukemia or thyroid cancer. Smoking one cigarette or 10 cigarettes is not the same risk. There is always a dose response relationship between the dose of exposure and the risk of cancer. And that relation can be uh, due to the dose of the exposure or to the duration of the exposure. For instance, if we take into account 
red meat or processed meat, which are considered as uh, uh, carcinogens for colorectal cancer by WHO, you can see on the left part that more red meat and processed meat you eat on an average per day, higher your risk of having uh, colorectal cancer. At the opposite side, more fish you eat, because usually you don't eat fish and meat at the same time, more fish you eat, which means less meat you eat, you will have a lower risk of colorectal cancer. So the dose matters. The duration also, whether you smoke less than a pack of cigarettes, 20 to 29 cigarettes per day, 30 to 39, or more than two packs of cigarettes per day, the duration of the exposure is important. You can see that between 10 years and 60 years of smoking, the risk is not going to be the same. So the dose of exposure, the duration of exposure matter. Now, if we know that, what can we do? Well, we can imagine two things. One is to eliminate the carcinogen. Well, it would be great. Or if we cannot eliminate, to reduce the exposure. So about eliminating. We, in the history of humanity, we have been trying to do such a thing in the 20s and 30s in the United States with the prohibition on another carcinogen, which is alcohol. It didn't work. In 1933, finally, they allowed the sale of alcohol because it didn't work. Trying to prohibit the drinking alcohol was the reason for the development of mobs, mafia, killing people and everything, violence. So finally, they stopped the idea. For tobacco smoking, there is also the this uh, framework convention on tobacco control with WHO signed by uh, 181 countries in the world trying to do the best, their best to uh, decrease the prevalence of smoking. Uh, did it work? We're going to do, to, to, does it work? Did it work? We're going to look at the results together. Before I, start, I continue my lecture, let me tell you, as an oncologist treating cancer patients for about 48 years, it is clear that the best is to quit smoking. There is no question about that. But can, is it easy and is it, uh, did we achieve that by what we have been doing in France, in Cyprus, everywhere in the world during the last 30 years? Let me show you. This is WHO data. What does that, what can you, what I am showing you here is that if you look at the cancer risk factors in Cyprus, in your country, all age, both sex, okay? In 1990, 30 years ago, the first cause of cancer was smoking. Since then, 1990 to 23, we have been trying in Cyprus and everywhere else to, to ask people to quit. We increase the cost, we have neutral pack of cigarettes, we have banning smoking in public places, many, many things. Did it work? 30 years ago, we still have smoking as the first cause, the first cancer risk factor for cancer in Cyprus. The conclusion is that it didn't work. So if it didn't work, we have to find something else. We cannot continue with the, the idea that we will get it by doing what we are doing. We have to find new ideas, new concepts. And here it comes to what we call arm reduction. People might think it's a new concept, not at all. It started in the early 80s when Mrs. Thatcher was the Prime Minister of United Kingdom. At that time, there was the rise in the epidemic of AIDS and viral hepatitis in IV drug users because they were exchanging needles and, and, and dirty syringes and everything. So at that time, they've been trying to convince these drug users to stop using IV drugs. But as you can imagine, for addicted people, they, they didn't achieve a great success. So, they finally decided, okay, they want to get IV drug. What we are going to do is, okay, you can continue, but we are going to try to avoid the bad consequences of this bad behavior. So they gave clean needles, clean syringes, and so on. And what happened because of that, very rapidly, uh, United Kingdom had the lowest rate, rate of, IV, of HIV in drug users in the world. So this is a demonstration that arm reduction can work. We have also the reverse demonstration in the same country because uh, over the past uh, 12 years, they changed completely the policy in the United Kingdom. And instead of looking for arm reduction in IV drug users, they start to say, no, what we want is abstinence-based policy. 
What happens since then? What are their outcomes? Drug-related fatalities in this population have doubled during the last uh, 10 years, and one in three drug-related deaths in Europe are in the UK. So we have the both demonstration that it can work and that if you stop doing that, you come back to the bad situation. So having said that, if you want to reduce the exposure, first of all, you must identify the nature, the production, and the exposure source of carcinogen. So the question is, when we talk to smoking is how does cigarette smoke can cause cancer? Well, it is very easy to to summarize this, burning tobacco leaves will generate a smoke. That tobacco smoke contains more than 6,000 chemicals and ultrafine particles. 93 of them are listed by the US Food and Drug Administration, FDA, as harmful and potentially harmful constituent. And the majority, about 80 of these 6,000 chemicals, are considered a real carcinogen or potential carcinogen. So this is the source of this carcinogen. How this, uh, is there something on which we could play to reduce the carcinogenicity of tobacco smoke? Yes, look at that slide. This is made by the US FDA. It's nothing to do with Philip Morris research, okay? It's a purely independent research experiment made by the US FDA. What that shows is that when you start heating the tobacco, there is no production of carcinogen. When you get above 350 centigrade, then you start having more and more of these 80 uh, carcinogen that cause cancer. So if you can heat and not burn, you may have a kind of smoke which actually is made purely of, it's an aerosol, it's made of water that will not contain or almost not contain these carcinogen that cause cancer. But then people, many people in the world start to think, but they will still get nicotine because indeed what people are smoking because they want nicotine and are dying because they got the smoke. But they want the nicotine and many people think that nicotine gives cancer. Absolutely not. This is a pure myth, uh, myth that nicotine is what makes tobacco use so deadly, but uh, not at all the nicotine can cause cancer. Nicotine does not cause cancer and uh, the best way to understand that statement is that it's more than 30 years that we as doctors give prescribed nicotine replacement therapy. You know, gums, patch, full of nicotine, and we don't get cancer. We give that freely to patients. They can even buy them at the pharmacy directly without any prescription because nicotine does not give cancer. What gives cancer for people trying to get nicotine is the smoke that comes with the combustion, the combustion of tobacco leaves. So again, I will repeat that, that every 10 minutes. Quitting tobacco smoking is by far the best option. But is it easy? Not at all, because it's an addiction. And if you look at the number of smokers in the world, in 1990, there was one billion smokers in the world. If you look at this number in, nine, in 2019, it was still one billion smokers because Smoking is an addiction. It's a disease. And it, cause, it causes disease also. But it's by itself a kind of disease. It's an addiction. So we have to try to offer to those people who cannot quit some alternative that can, uh, that can be uh, safer for them. Why? The, again, the best demonstration that what I'm telling you is true. As a clinical oncologist look, seeing patients every week, every, almost every day, is that studies have shown that even 64%, a huge majority of smokers diagnosed with lung cancer, they know they are going to get chemotherapy, radiation, key, they are going to die, even though they will continue to smoke after the diagnosis until their death, because again, it's an addiction. So the concept of harm reduction is not only on tobacco smoking. The concept is to accept some level of bad behaviors because you, the people want to continue their bad behaviors, but to try to minimize the arms, people will suffer as a consequence of the bad behavior. But this is true for many things. For instance, driving cars. In my country, we have 3,000 deaths every year from car accidents. So we could say, don't drive, finish with car. No, 
what we, we, we expect that innovation and science will make driving safer, like with seat belts, airbags, disc brakes, and that people will continue to drive, will continue to have accident, but there will be less wounded and death. You can do that using statin and stents and, and aspirin for NLC diet and sunscreen for sun exposure and everything. So what about smoking? Can science and innovation bring a change for smoking for smokers? And this is being called for years by all health agency. In the United States, the FDA, FDA will encourage the innovation of less harmful product. Uh, Public Health England in the United Kingdom, uh, the government is committed to help people to quit smoking by permitting innovative technologies in Australia, everywhere in the world. Every agency is calling for innovation. And this innovation has have come now to uh, the market. Uh, for instance, if you consider combustible cigarette, you know, the classical Marlboro, for instance, as a risk of 100% to get some tobacco-related cancer. You can see that cigars, for instance, will be half the risk. But if you look at uh, uh, tools without any combustion, you can see that it's much uh, heat not burn, for instance, is the third one, will be just 3.3% uh, compared to 100%. So again, and SNUS, which is another product that is being used for 40 years in Sweden, where they have now less than 5% of smokers. In your country, male, 49%. So this little uh, reservoir of nicotine that you put under your lip will has decreased the number of smokers in Sweden down to 5%. And, and uh, this product, I mean, SNUS, electronic cigarette, heat not burn, called ICOS, for instance, all these innovation have achieved the possibility to decrease the number of smoking, helping them to quit, and most probably will decrease the, the number, the prevalence of tobacco-related cancer. So th this study has tried to, uh, to compare the cancer potency of nicotine and tobacco-containing products. You can see that again, if you consider one, the risk of cigarettes, you can see that electronic cigarette is going to be 0.002%, and that high cost will be 0.02%. So it's not risk free is risk reduced. There is a residual risk which is in the range of 2-3%. So it's not risk free, but it's much less risky than combustible cigarette. And uh, the trends following the introduction in the market of non-combustible products, you can see that for instance in the United Kingdom, if you look at the gray bar, the gray line, you can see that as, as far as you raise the uh, the number of people using electronic cigarettes from 1.7% uh, 10 years ago to 6% in 2017, you get a decrease in the number of smokers of real cigarettes, which has, are very dangerous for your health. You can see also here, again in England, uh, that, uh, ele that electronic cigarette and heat not burn, I mean the ICOS, are the best tools that smokers are using with efficiency to stop, to quit smoking. You can see that uh, the, the Champix and nicotine replacement therapy are less and less used, but electronic cigarettes is now 40% uh, used by smokers to quit smoking. So there is a, a real impact uh, on, of this uh, product on the health situation for in England and in many other countries like has been shown in Japan, in New Zealand, in Greece also, for instance. So if you look at um, the best way to quit smoking, and you compare either to reduce or to quit smoking between electronic cigarette efficacy and nicotine replacement therapy, the, ba the, the, the gums, the patches, you can see that if you look at reduction, the first two lines, you can compare. It's at four weeks, it's 42% versus 23%. And if you look at six months, it's 26% for electronic cigarette um, against 6%. So it's a four, five times better, more efficient. If you look at cessation, quitting completely, if you look at six, six months, you can see that with nicotine replacement therapy, you get only 3%, whether with electronic cigarette, you get almost 20%. So really, these new products 
this alternative to smoking that are what we call risk-reduced products are very efficient in quitting. So uh, this is the director of the Public Health England, which is the equivalent of the FDA in the United Kingdom. What he says is that he stated that uh, every minute someone is admitted to hospital for smoking with around 79,000 deaths a year just in England, not United Kingdom. And there, the Public Health England review reinforces the finding that vaping is a fraction of the risk of smoking, at least 95% less harmful. So again, it's not risk-free, it's risk-reduced and of a negligible risk to bystanders. Yet, over half of smokers either falsely believe that vaping is, an harmful, is as harmful as smoking or just don't know. So this is why people like me are doing lectures everywhere to explain that it is safer. And it would be tragic if thousands of smokers who could quit with the help of an electronic cigarette or ICOS are being put off due to false fears about, uh, about the safety of this product. Uh, the second trend that we can see in Japan, because in Japan, uh, ICOS was launched in 2015, is that if you increase the sales of ICOS, you decrease at the same time very significantly the prevalence, the sales of real, real cigarettes, of combustible cigarettes. So, in conclusion, cancer is a major public health issue. Tobacco is the leading cause of cancer 30 years ago and till today, not only oral, but many types of uh, cancer. Quitting is by far the best option, but is very difficult, even for those people who have cancer. Current strategies, increasing the cost, banning smoking, uh, neutral pack of cigarettes, everything you, you have been doing, we have been doing the last, during the last 30 years have failed. So innovation might bring us the solution both for helping people to quit, I showed you, and to reduce the harm for those who cannot quit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kayat, uh, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to ask the audience, uh, is there any question? Any question from the audience? No. Then I think I, can, I have a question. Okay, two questions. Uh, I would like to ask you, could you give us uh, some paradigms of uh, the comparison of certain carcinogens concentration in novel tobacco products versus the cigarette smoke? Uh, that are known to be involved in lung cancer development, in oral cancer development, and, and, and uh, an additional scale, as I am also an embryologist, I would like to ask you, if we have uh, some data for pregnancy outcomes, if a pregnant mother who must not uh, smoke, of course, uh, is using uh, by chance or because she cannot stop it, uh, is using those uh, new products, uh, the electronic cigarette instead of uh, the conventional smoke. So if I understand, there were two questions. One is, is there a, what's happened with the chemicals that give yes. different types of cancer and disease? And the second is about pregnancy? And pregnancy, yes, okay. thank you very much. So uh, again, uh, I decided to work on that field, the day I read the uh, independent FDA report. They have been evaluating these products in their own facilities in Florida for four years, and they concluded that these products, I mean, ICOS and electronic cigarettes, are better for the health of the US population compared to combustible cigarettes. Now, looking at the different carcinogens, th there is no one carcinogen that gives one cancer. All these are, are all the carcinogens, about 80, benzoapyrene, I mean, acronine, and many of them are making mutation on DNA that will, if they are not repaired, will finally end up with a cancer. And they are not repaired because you smoke every day, uh, you smoke a large number of cigarettes every day, and even if you repair one mutation, there will be another one, and at the end, uh, for many people, uh, the, there will be unrepaired mutation in the onset of cancer. So I can, for the first answer, is the same. For pregnancy, um, you know, smoking 
uh, whatever it is, uh, as, as long as there is uh, combustion, because combustion will induce the occurrence of carcinogens, even if it's just heating. I mean, if it's just heating, there will still be about 2% risk, 2% concentration of carcinogens compared to combustible cigarettes. So if you smoke this, uh, this um, I'm talking about ICOS, I mean, uh, uh, heat not burn device, it's like if you smoke one cigarette instead of uh, 10 cigarettes, but you still smoke some uh, tobacco related uh, device. So I would recommend a pregnant women to not to touch anything. Now, regarding uh, the, the, that might be a second question, might be very interesting, is the uh, youth up uptake. So um, if you look at, uh, there are two points. One is electronic cigarettes. The point is that in many countries, and I spoke this morning with the Minister of Health in Cyprus, you have to ban these disposable electronic cigarettes with flavor of strawberry and, and everything, because that, the, the young people like that very much, it's very cheap, and that is a bad, uh, is made by China, is, uh, this should be forbidden, and in many places, including in my country, there is a ban, legal ban on this product. If you look at ICOS, it's more expensive, it's much more controlled, because to buy one, you have to, to be uh, uh, aged enough and, and many things. Uh, the, there are studies in Germany, in Japan, in Netherlands, showing that the youth uptake, people of less than 17 years old who try to buy one and to use that, is in the range of 0.5 percent, so it's very, very low. Uh, so that's the first part, the pregnancy I answered. So I think I answered your question. Thank you very much, Professor Higat. Uh, I think we have another question from yes. the audience. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great talk. Uh, I have two questions. So the first one is uh, the e-cigarettes are fairly what, new. What? E? The e-cigarettes e or the yeah. vaping is, is fairly new. So is there research either in animal models or clinical to back up that they're less harmful than the cigarettes? Oh, yes. Yeah. My, okay, thank you. And my next question is, you mentioned those flavored uh, va vaping, the flavored vaping with the... Yeah, that should be uh, forbidden. So uh, do we have numbers of if people that use this alternative, uh, the vaping, are people that are trying to quit cigarettes versus people that are starting smoking no. the vaping? No, really, uh, the huge majority, I we're talking about more than 90% of the users are people that try to quit. quit. And today, by every agency, in public health, England, FDA, and everything, uh, electronic cigarettes and ICOS are considered the best tools to quit, yes. not to enter into the addiction of nicotine, okay? Uh, as actually uh, the patch, the patches of nicotine are, and the gums are on the market for 40 years. You know, when I was an intern, for very young, there was still, there was already this product. Nothing, nobody is going to start the addiction to nicotine with them. And very few people are starting the nicotine addiction because of this product. But there are some, not for ICOS, but for electronic cigarettes. So the reason, if I may, because we have the uh, story of Evali. I don't know if you know what is Evali, but I'm going to explain you. Uh, the, there is less regulation on electronic cigarettes than on ICOS. And there is a lot of illicit trade of that. I mean, China is, is sending kilos tons of this product in Europe, in the European market. So when there is less regulation, there is less control, it opens the market to marketing issues that may push people to use, to, to use it uh, unfavorably. When it comes to ICOS, because it's much more regulated, you cannot go and say, I want to buy one. You have to declare that you are smoking, you have to be 18, and so on, and it's expensive. So then there is less. Why it is important, how it came to the knowledge that controlling is so important? Because in the beginning in the United States, talking about five, four years ago, it was free. You know, the, the American market is free. An electronic cigarette, you can buy and everything. There was absolutely no control. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden about four years ago, we had 400 deaths of young people during the summer. And they thought, it was because of e-cigarette. So they banned e-cigarette for four months, they were afraid and so on. What happened? 
is that because in the United States, the electronic cigarette reservoirs were open, so you can put whatever you want inside. And these people took marijuana, I mean cannabis, and mix it in the reservoir with acetate vitamin E, which is totally toxic for the lung, but it increases the effect of cannabis. So they started to smoke that because it was a free market, and they got damage in the lungs, and many people died. And they found the CDC, you know, the Center for Disease Control, and the FDA found it out a few months later. It was an unused of the, and then they put a regulation. You can, now the United States is like in Europe. You cannot put anything you want inside. So to answer your question, again, it's not risk-free. Electronic cigarette is very, 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 very limited risk. Heat not burn, there is a 2% risk com compared to combustible cigarette. But compared to cigarette, I mean, can you imagine 48 years of treating cancer patients? How many of them I've seen that were smokers? So if we can have something less toxic, we'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from... Thank you. Thank you. Um, we hope you enjoy Cyprus and thank you for coming. Uh, we will now hear from the Masters of Ceremony and we will receive some information regarding when we come back from the lunch break. Thank you. Please join us for a light lunch buffet in the foyer and the poster session. The next session will begin at 1. Thank you. <laughs>